Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you here uh, after the summer break that you hopefully all were able to enjoy despite the corona uh, situation. We are pleased that we have almost 500 registrations for this interesting topic today. And our ambition is to give an overview about the current regulation uh, of digital assets as it is unfolding. Uh, across the EU. Uh, and we also want to span um, from the financial sector where regulation is of course already in, in place, at least partially, but also uh, talk about industrial tokenization and uh, what we need to take into account there uh, and ending with uh, also discussions around smart contracts. That's also where uh, the idea for this event uh, started when uh, we had a hearing with Inatba uh, where Riddle & Code is also a member, um, and the EU Commission uh, talking about the use of uh, smart contracts in the industrial context, because this will, of course, be the next frontier of regulation after harmonizing um, the financial uh, side of the digital assets sphere. And that's also uh, why we are very pleased, together with our co-organizers of uh, INATPA, to invite Lukas Repa, um, to talk about uh, the current status. He's a senior policy advisor at the European Commission. He's very much busy these days with uh, interesting European programs. Europe Digital is one of them. EPSI, the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure is the other, uh, but he's also having tons of meetings, I assume, with the uh, Central Bank in Frankfurt and other uh, players in the financial markets to assess you know, not only the status, but also the outlook. Uh, for regulation in Europe, uh, and he will open this session today uh, with a few words um, and give us uh, the big picture. Uh, and then there will we will be a fireside chat uh, between Lucas and Mark Tavane, uh, the Secretary General of Inatpa. So we hope this is a very interesting start for today's session. Uh, it will also be recorded. Uh, so for all of your colleagues that might not be able to join today. It will be available on demand on YouTube, and we will all let you know about this. So without much further ado, handing over to Lukas, which is, of course, very, uh, you know, a fellow Austrian. Um, personally, I'm, I'm German, but working for an Austrian company such as Riddle & Code, it's always great to see that people from Vienna are very active in this space. Over to you, Lukas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you for having the European Commission invited and participated. It's my pleasure to speak here today from a little home office in my attic. So uh, I, I would like to use the next five, six minutes perhaps to provide the big picture before we zoom in into the details of regulation for tokenization. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that, that Mark Tevin and other excellent experts are here today. We'll have certainly a lively discussion. So the European Commission has really started its policy for blockchain and distributed ledgers about five years ago when we brought the member state experts and national initiatives on blockchain together under one hood, which is the European Blockchain Partnership. And this European Blockchain Partnership is building with our support a, a European blockchain services infrastructure. So we are not only talking about regulation and policy for blockchain, we are actually also building our own blockchain for the public sector. And, uh, and on top of this, we also have set up a, a think tank, the European uh, Observatory and Forum, which has been instrumental in helping us civil servants understand the technology in the first instance, and then later on, help us design also the regulatory policies that are now being put forward. So the Observatory, our think tank, the European Blockchain Partnership, as, as our, uh, our policy arm and then the European blockchain services infrastructure, which is really our test bed for blockchain technologies and our way to, to use the public sector as an accelerator and as an icebreaker for blockchain technology. I will be glad to talk about where we are with these blockchains, but I understand the emphasis of our discussion today is on regulation uh, and, and on the financial regulation in particular on crypto assets. So let me try to provide the bigger picture here as well. So at the beginning of our regulatory um, 
endeavors for the crypto assets was a situation that we have very detailed financial regulation under the so-called MIFID directive, which affects financial assets, investment instruments, essentially. And one of the most difficult questions that arose very quickly for financial regulators about four or five years ago at the peak of the cryptocurrency uh, boom, I would say, the first boom in 2014-15 was, do these crypto assets qualify as investment instruments? Are they securities? And as you may have heard, the answer to that question was very different when it comes to the United States of America and when it comes to the European Union. In the United States of America, the Securities and Exchange Commission applied a principle-based case law and applied a very extensive interpretation of what is a security, which essentially made a lot of initial coin offerings and crypto asset offerings, uh, a security offering in the United States of America with all consequences it had. In the European Union, to the contrary, the situation was rather different. In the European Union, our harmonization of securities laws is not perfect. It's not 100%. It leaves a lot of discretion to the individual member states to define what is an investment instrument. And that led to a situation that in the European Union, the digital single market was fragmented in terms of legislation. You had national regulators that would qualify an initial coin offering as a security offering, whereas a neighboring country could perfectly qualify the same initial coin offering as the sale of a commodity, if you want. So we treat it very differently. And obviously that is not an ideal situation because startups were confronted with the risk that an initial coin offering they would vet with one regulator and it would be approved by one national regulator could uh, strike a snag and get into difficulties uh, in another member state of the European Union. So the European Union, the European Commission had to intervene. We had to intervene in order to create legal certainty. Legal certainty by law. And the result of this endeavor is the, uh, the markets and crypto assets regulation that has been now underway more than, than a year and a half. We've proposed a comprehensive legal framework for crypto assets that regulates crypto assets as far as they are not under financial services regulation. And that means that in particular, the so-called stable coins, the utility tokens, um, and, and crypto assets other than financial instruments are now subject to one regulatory framework that is at the moment after adoption by the commission, going through the usual legislative procedure. First step is the European uh, Council of the European Union and the second step is the European Parliament where the ECON committee is responsible for reviewing the draft. Um, the latest developments with the markets and crypto assets regulations that the Portuguese presidency of the council has made an enormous effort to bring the file forward. It's now with, uh, uh, with parliament. Same thing with uh, another related uh, framework, which is the so-called pilot, pilot framework for crypto assets regulation. So that's the big picture. The European Commission has also realized that if we want to provide legal certainty, uh, we have to do more than only providing a regulatory framework. We also have to help the industry experiment uh, with new forms of crypto assets and blockchain technology in a safe environment. And, and that is why we have proposed a second legislative framework, which is called the pilot, the pilot framework. The pilot framework is essentially a regulatory sandbox which allows national uh, regulators uh, to uh, exempt uh, multilateral trading platforms for crypto assets of certain requirements, certain specific requirements that would typically apply for the trading of securities, thereby making it easier for these multilateral trading platforms to trade crypto assets in the European Union. That, however, under strict cooperation supervision with the national regulator. This pilot project has attracted a lot of interest and controversial discussion in the legislative process. So the parliament in particular uh, has 
uh, and the council have pushed for widening even the scope of the pilot project in the latest iterations. The idea is to allow more securities to be tokenized and to be traded in this regulatory sandbox and also to give more uh, new market entrants the possibility to uh, participate in the regulatory sandbox um, of the European Union. Um, and then besides the Mika and, and the pilot project, the European Commission is at the moment considering to set up its own regulatory sandbox for blockchain technologies in the framework of the European Blockchain Partnership and the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure. That is a project that we want to put forward as soon as the Digital Europe program has been adopted. You may have heard that the Digital Europe project is one of our flagship financial instruments to accelerate uh, the growth and the distribution of technology in the European Union. And uh, a quite significant compartment of this Digital Europe program will go to blockchain technology. And we will use this funding in part by offering the possibility to participate in a pan-European regulatory sandbox uh, that is uh, attached to the European blockchain partnership. So that's a little bit the, the, big, the big picture. If we now drill down a little bit more into the details of our financial reg framework for crypto assets, uh, the Mika uh, proposal makes a distinction between certain categories of crypto assets. And it's not the typical holy trinitas, uh, trias that we have found before the investment, in the investment token, the utility token and, and other tokens, but it is, it is more according to risk categories. And, and the reason why we decided to go uh, according to this approach is that uh, in particular, the development in the stablecoin uh, segment required uh, us to approach uh, this phenomenon with a more nuanced uh, regulatory solution. Um, stable coins in particular have a lot of potential, but they're also, of course, because of their potential global aspirations, a uh, very different cookie than a, a small utility token used in, in one single blockchain network. So for the stable coins, the regulation, the proposal for the regulation introduces uh, essentially uh, two types of stable coins. One stable coin category, uh, the e-money tokens, and the other one, the um, the asset reference tokens. And the asset reference tokens are those that would basically be backed up with assets from more than one uh, fiat currency. For instance, they could, they could reference gold, they could reference a basket of assets, whereas the e-money tokens reference typically a single fiat currency such as the US dollar, the European, uh, the Euro. Um, so that's in a nutshell, an overview of what we're doing, where we come from, uh, what the regulation is striving to achieve. And, and I'm excited to have your questions and to engage in a discussion. Thank you, Sebastian, for, for giving us the floor. You're welcome, Lucas. Um, if I could just invite uh, Mark uh, Tavanet to join us and take over the discussion with Lucas. Um, there was one question. Uh, for Michael, uh, Lucas, where uh, we can follow future developments on regulatory sandboxes. Is there an, a, a homepage or is this more a question that you can answer via direct no, email? No, I, I can answer this straight on. So the moment that we adopt the Digital Europe program and we have the funding for the sandbox, we are going to announce the launch of the sandbox on our website. So just follow uh, our European Commission uh, portal for blockchain policy. I think you can Google it very easily. Just type European Commission and blockchain policy and you've got us. And this is where we're going to publish uh, news about the sandbox. Okay, thank you. And over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And thank you, Lucas. What a wonderful summary. I was frantically making notes here on my side, Lucas, to try and not lose that great summary um, in the vagueness of my memory fade of an old man. So good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. 
Uh, I'm Mark Tavener, the Executive Director of INATPA. We represent uh, about 170 members of which Riddle, Riddle and Code is a very proud member. And we've been working extensively with the European Commission, who I'd like to commend actually, on the development of policy that relates to blockchain technologies, not just blockchains that represent crypto assets. Um, Specifically, I'd just like to highlight a, a couple of really positive points uh, about how the European Commission has been developing their strategy and three notes that I made was, uh, and this is the, the first one that struck me that I just wanted to highlight. The European Commission is building its own blockchain. Now just take a moment and think about that when we talk about regulators, because the biggest challenge that we hear from our members and that we see ourselves as in ACPA is the lack of education. And as we all know, the best way to educate yourselves about technology is to jump in, jump in at the deep end, learn by doing, try and build things, break things, figure out how to put them back together. And what better situation to have than one where the European Commission is building its own blockchain, is overseeing the distribution, the bringing to life of applications that will work on top of that infrastructure. And I'm of course referring to EBSI. So I think in Europe, we all need to, to hold at the top of our minds the fact that we have some of the best practice approach to regulation because the commission has laid out a very clear strategy. Not only are they building their own blockchain and using that as a test bed and an accelerator, but they're creating an ability for the wider market to understand the technology. And we work very closely with the observatory and forum uh, that Lucas referenced, which is the platform that has been chosen by the commission to help spread that education, to run the surveys, to produce the reports, to solicit evidence from the industry, to bring the industry together and to debate, discuss and learn on a, on a common journey. And then the final piece is to the European blockchain partnership, which is where individual contributors from the member states come together to focus on the developments of this technology with a particular lens being brought to bear around regulation. We're in are very proud to be involved in all three of those pillars of this strategy. But uh, I don't think Sebastian has invited me here today to compliment Lucas, to continually highlight the good work that Lucas and the team at the Commission have been doing. And I don't think Lucas is expecting me all morning to talk about just how great they are. Uh, so a few things I'd like to pick up on um, and to bring into discussion, Lucas, if you don't mind. The first is, uh, I was struck by the waves of technology. And, and I think that was the phrase you mentioned referring to the early days of, of crypto. So it's fair to say we're around about three waves into the birth of this technology. The first was the initial crypto boom, so to say, where we measured the size of the industry, perhaps in hundreds of millions of euros. And I was involved in that in the very early stages with a very large uh, Bitcoin miner. We were constantly looking at the size of the market to try and understand when legitimacy would be reached, when the market was large enough to command the attention of the regulators, the established players, and when we could start engaging in what we call mature industry discussions. That didn't really happen when we were measuring the industry at hundreds of millions. We then saw the ICO wave, where we started to measure the size of the industry in single billions, single billions. And we were looking at you know, how much is being raised in each ICO, what's the total value of the ICO market. And we reached a level which was you know, probably around about, depending on who you listen to, certainly under 10 billion euros. Now we're in the DeFi wave, and suddenly we're measuring the size of the market in tens of billions. And we're not very far away from being into the hundreds of billions. And we're still looking for this moment of legitimacy this opportunity to come to the table and discuss with the established players, this chance to have a profound impact on how regulation is developed. So the first question, which I'll come back to Lucas, and this might be just a personal opinion you give, is do we need to wait for a fourth, fifth and sixth wave? <laughs> or are the regulators paying attention to our little industry now and realizing that there is something which is going to happen anyway? 
the second topic I'd like to, to have a discussion with you about is on this need for continued education and the regulatory sandbox. So it is true, as Sebastian mentioned, and you mentioned, Lucas, that we've done a lot of work together with many of our members on contributing evidence, contributing discussion, points of view from all of our members and the wider industry on two significant files, Mika, which I'll come back to, but the pilot regime, which I'd like to start with, and this is my, my third point. The pilot regime is wonderful in its concept, but is severely lacking in fundamental details in about three or four areas. Now, I do recognize, Lucas, that the pilot regime is not a file that was the instigation of DG Connect. Um, however, you are the representative of the commission. So the thoughts I'd like to discuss with you there is how can this opportunity of the pilot regime be seized upon, given it is a file traveling through the commission, through parliament, and has the attention of regulators, how can it be turned into something which is actually useful? And I use my words very specifically because the feedback that I've received from our members is that the concept is magnificent, but the execution, frankly, is woefully lacking. And by that, what I mean is just to, to be a bit more specific, um, is we see that the scope is very limited and ideally should be expanded. And by that, what we mean is at the moment, the scope of the pilot regime really only there is there to benefit the established players. If we look at the scope of the tools, of the products that are going to be admitted into the regulatory sandbox, it's really only those that are the existing investment firms and credit institutions that can make the most of this. That excludes immediately the entire DeFi industry and one would argue the entire blockchain industry, particularly if you take into consideration the sheer lack of tech neutrality, technology neutrality that is currently reflected in the pilot regime whereby public blockchains are entirely excluded, or there is a risk that public blockchains will be entirely excluded. So we think that the scope is limited and should be expanded. We also think that the thresholds and the range of eligible securities is not representative of what's really going on in the market. You know, we see that the limit at the moment is placed at a cap of 200 million euros, or was, at least in, in the first reading of the, the file. We think that that limit should be increased to at least 500 million euros and should be extended to increase uh, to in, include bonds and realize that there should be a reflection of the total market value of shares and bonds so that we can have a sandbox which is truly more reflective of the real world operating models. Uh, and I, I also bring back the point I mentioned earlier that we think at the moment, the pilot regime presents an uneven playing field because it's rather like saying, if we draw a parallel with the telecoms industry, it's rather like saying the telecoms industry across Europe is open to any new market, market entrant who wants to come. But first, you need to lay copper in the ground from the exchange to every house on every street that you want to service. And when you've done that, will then let you have a digital over air license if you want it. So the fact that the pilot regime is currently restricted or is in largely part favoring those institutions which are already accredited and puts a requirement on new market entrants to gain accreditation first before they can access the sandbox, we think presents a little bit of an uneven playing field. Um, and then the final point, Lucas, uh, around the pilot regime, and this is really the topic of sandbox per se, is that we think the duration of five years and the review process over five years as initially proposed is just too long and inflexible. Earlier on, I laid out a 10 year period uh, of the waves where we saw the market value rise from just a few uh, hundreds of millions of euros to something that we're going to be measuring very shortly in hundreds of billions of euros. A technology in a market moving at such pace would not uh, be well served by a sandbox that paused after a five-year period to review progress. So 
the third point I wanted to discuss with you, and maybe I pause here before I go into Mika, is around the need, the absolute need, for a new sandbox to be established. And as you know, Lucas, it's not a public release yet, though I guess with just under 200 participants on this call, it, it might be considered public as soon as I mention it. Inatbra is very keen on pushing for a specific approach to establish a sandbox that would be focused on decentralized autonomous organizations, the particular use cases that are springing up around decentralized finance, and to include non-fungible tokens and these massively interesting use cases that we see. We think a specific sandbox with a very clear purpose that is a, a, a trajectory towards learning, towards perhaps a route to provide some sort of clarity on auditability of code and maybe even data is a more constructive approach than perhaps the vehicle that's currently laid out in the pilot regime. So let me pause at those points, uh, at that point, Lucas, to see uh, how you'd like to come back on, on those three topics. So as you see, I, I did the, the old butcher trick. I softened you up gently with some very fair and very honest, positive comments and then laid in a, a, a few observations um, uh, about where imp we think improvements could be made on behalf of Inatva. So, so Lucas, why don't you, uh, I invite you back just to comment on what I've said. So Mark, I'm going to have a sip of a strong coffee before I reply to you. You've softened me <laughs> up nicely and then you beat me to the bush, but uh, let, me, let me apply the same tactics to you, Mark. So let <laughs> me pay back in kind. <laughs> so first of all, the soft part, Mark, I, I think I should congratulate you because you have been much too modest in, in presenting the pilot project. So the moaning that you have been, that you've started about pilot uh, has been heard to a certain extent, I would like to say. I think you have used your, your, your contacts to parliament and to council very well to, uh, to soften up the legislator in the second and third round. It is true that the proposal of the commission in the beginning uh, was a proposal, I would say, that was a bit limited. But it is also true, I think, that in the course of the legislative discussions, uh, things have shifted. So perhaps we have to take that into consideration as well. My understanding is that in the latest iteration in council, the Portuguese presidency has proposed to, uh, to widen the scope of the instruments that co could go into the pilot. I think we have to recognize that. And it also has made a move on the second point that you mentioned, which is the, the scope of participants. So it has made a step towards making it somewhat easier for the new market entrants to also benefit from the pilot regulatory sandbox, provided that at the same moment they enter the sandbox, they also apply for the necessary licenses. Now, I should like to push back on your comparison with the telcos and laying the copper cables into the ground. Mark, I think that's not fair. I think, uh, honestly, uh, if you have to apply for a license, if you want to enter a sandbox, it's not that you have to lay copper in the ground. We are, we're really talking about two different things here. But I take your point that uh, the pilot uh, sandbox was not specifically designed to tackle uh, phenomena such as decentralized finance, which have very specific challenges for regulators that are not the typical challenges we face in tokenizing securities. Namely, DeFi, the main challenge is that there is no clear regulatory um, point of responsibility. If you look at the DeFi systems, they're everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And regulators in the first instance don't know whether they're competent to regulate and to intervene. That's the biggest challenge. Uh, I think I agree with you that it would be useful uh, to have something specifically dedicated to that phenomenon. Uh, I agree also that probably the pilot regulatory sandbox, which has not been specifically designed for this phenomenon, is, is not an area that is uh, perfectly suited for DeFi. Um, and, and, and I would like to say, would like to say this, the pilot regulatory sandbox is unique in the sense that if you compare it to the sandboxes that we find in other jurisdictions, such as in the Anglo-American world, in particular in Great Britain or in Singapore, um, the sandboxes there do not give the regulator the possibility to lift 
certain regulatory requirements. There are factual cooperations between a regulator and the startup where the regulator explains to the startup the legislation, accompanies them in the first months and years of the existence, helps them to comply, but they're not lifting any requirements. So what the European Union has actually proposed is unique worldwide. We are not only encouraging the regulators to work with the blockchain industry, we are giving them the possibility to lift certain requirements under the existing European secondary legislation when it comes to a central clearing, a settlement uh, and trading. So uh, in pushing back on, on, on your, your kiss slap kiss uh, talk, I would like to underline that the commission and actually has done here something quite courageous. We have actually encouraged the regulators to lift requirements. Um, so, so that's a little bit of a, of, of a pushback on, on pilot, but I think I, I hear what you say and I like your idea of encouraging a specific regulatory sandbox for DeFi and, and for non-fungible tokens. We will have to see whether what we will do under the Digital Euro program could be suitable for this. It's an interesting suggestion. Um, for non-fungible non tokens, and you will come to Mika in a moment, you know that they are at the moment outscoped of, of the Mika. So that would mean that it is not about interpreting the Mika, it's about interpreting generally all other legislation that could apply to the sale of non-fungible tokens, including consumer protection rules, which are completely different cookie. And, uh, and when it comes to uh, the, uh, the decentralized DeFi, I think we, we have to, to think together uh, how to um, find the regulatory access points that can be clearly identified and then build a regulatory framework around it to provide legal certainty. Interesting, Lucas. Thank you for your comments. Uh, my mind is drawn to the topic that Sebastian mentions during his introduction on smart contracts because so much of regulation is intertwined given we're talking about technology with so many different areas, right? So DeFi can't exist without smart contracts. Smart contracts can't exist unless we have trust in the data and trust in the code. So I think you're absolutely right, Lucas, that the current vehicles, and even if we take something as recent as Mika, right, which was, what, 26th of September, I think it was, so this time last year, we started looking at the version of Mika that was passed from the Commission to Parliament. So it's still quite recent, <clears throat> but we're finding that wanting at the moment in certain areas because we've learned more about this industry. So the topic of smart contracts, which I know we're addressing in part through the Data Act and the work we're doing with you there, but that doesn't entirely go to the topic of data. Where does the data come from? How do we trust the data? that oftentimes these smart contracts are built upon. And then the wider question of how do we create trust in the code? Because we as the industry, when we talk about blockchain and in particular DeFi and the applications being, on, uh, being built on DeFi, heralds the fact that we can now negate the need to trust individuals and have individuals controlling a, a central function because we can codify it. Well, how do we have trust in the code? Uh, you know, is there a rule for a regulator, to, for example, to audit protocols, to audit code? And would that be a form of licensing? I just wonder what your thoughts on those very wide topics are, if indeed you personally or, or, or the commission have developed any thinking on that. Because finally, from an activist perspective, we think these topics could form part of this sandbox and this learning journey that we go on together. Very good. So smart contracts have been a point of attention for us already for, for two years. I think we started them with two in-depth studies. One has been published and the other one will be published in the next week or in two weeks. There are, there are two big groups of questions around smart contracts. The first ones are technical questions uh, and you refer to them. Can we trust the code? Is the code really replicating what it should do or is it doing something completely different? The black box problem. 
the second one is a whole load of civil law questions that are related to it. When does code turn into a legally binding agreement? Uh, when can we say that even without any prose contract, the code itself, the smart contract, could, could constitute a legally binding agreement? That's a very tricky legal question. So on both ends, we are thinking, we are listening, we are listening to the industry. And, and, and I would like to play the ball back in a way. I mean, what would you think is the ideal scenario? We have possibilities, you know, to standardize. We have standard setting bodies. Uh, the European Commission is represented at ISO TC307, at ETSI, at Sense and ELEC, with very good context to IEEE. Their standardization efforts for smart contracts are progressing. Would you think that these standardization efforts uh, on smart contracts as they are progressing today are sufficiently mature? Is there a role for the Commission to play to accelerate them, to coordinate them? Is there a role for INATPA to play to advance the standardization of smart contracts so that people can trust the code? Or do we first need to adopt a law that says every standard smart contract has to be standardized according to the following essential requirements and here's the law? So what, what, what would the industry say to that? Are we ready to standardize smart contracts or is it too mature? I, uh, it's a great point. I see Sebastian would like us to wrap up. So maybe I could answer your question very briefly uh, by saying this is a fascinating topic, maybe to end this particular part of the conference on, because finally we're talking about how a regulator in the commission can make use of the technology to apply regulation, to bring some security to consumers and to create market stability. And that, as you know, Lucas, is a drum that I've been banging for a very long time, which is that at least part of the solution could lie within the technology itself. So finding a way to audit the code, to give confidence in the code, to ensure that the technology itself, perhaps, is part of the regulatory process, is something that I know a lot of our members have been suggesting would be a very logical step. And I hope that by setting up some sort of sandbox and continuing to drive that approach with the support of the commission, our valuable members such as Riddle and Code and Sebastian, we can finally show people that the technology has some of the solutions within it, as well as providing great opportunity. So Sebastian, I know you'd like us to wrap up. My apologies, I've gone one minute over at the time that you asked me to stick to. But uh, Lucas, thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me play the good cop, bad cop, all in one voice. <laughs> and Sebastian, I know you would like to move on with the rest of the session. Thanks a lot, Mark and Lucas. This was a very interesting chat. Uh, and of course, we all realized, you know, we could go on for hours. Uh, but we promise it will not be the last webinar that we, we set up. And I, I promise, especially to the two of you, We'll be back. Uh, maybe let's you know give it another year and, and see where Mika has taken us and, and which kind of sandbox environments uh, we've been creating um, as part of the the you know group of companies that is currently working on upgrading uh, EPSI. We at Riddle & Code are, of course, also looking forward to it. And we think, you know, there's both room for, you know, a, a bottom-up um, architectural plan, uh, but also, you know, the, the cross-industry uh, and uh, industry lobbying level of looking at sandboxes and, and how we can bring things together. Um, so thanks very much for this overview about the status quo of um, regulation and, and the bigger picture. And I would like now to hand over to another uh, driver of the European discussion, Robert Kopic. Uh, he's the Secretary General of Blockchain for Europe. Uh, and I'd like him to run the next panel, which is focusing on the impact uh, of the current status of regulation on the German speaking markets, especially, uh, and with a focus on, on the financial institution. So Robert, stage is yours. Thanks, Sebastian, and uh, thanks for having us. Um, glad to be here, and um, I'm seeing already that uh, Mark is doing a great job pushing the commission very hard. So if Lucas has to take an extra sip of coffee, everybody that knows him uh, knows hmm, it's getting tough now. So well done. Um, to move on to the next panel, um, <clears throat> sorry, I would like to introduce uh, our distinguished uh, panelists today. 
So we have a who is who of the legal industry in the Dach region today. Um, so without any particular order or ranking, uh, I would like to introduce you to Thomas Negele, who is the attorney at law at Negele, uh, Raphael Thoman, who is associate partner at Brandl Talos, uh, Jennifer Zellweger, uh, she's the head of strategic initiatives at Signum Bank, uh, and last but not least, Ali Reza Ziadat, who's a partner at Eden. Thanks guys for being with us today. Um, as you're all from different countries of our Dach region, uh, I would like to give you all the opportunity to give the audience a bit of an idea of what's actually happening in your markets. What do you see as a strength and a, maybe a weakness in the market? Some of you are living in countries that are part of the European Union. And therefore there's a bit of a different angle than for example, in Switzerland or Liechtenstein. And I would like to go basically from smallest to biggest uh, and uh, Liechtenstein in this case is the smallest one to maybe start with uh, how did you approach the regulatory challenge uh, when you saw blockchain crypto uh, in Liechtenstein and then I would like to move to Switzerland, Austria and Germany uh, to give you all an, uh, an idea of what's going on where maybe the, the, the innovation is coming from, what could we do better in certain places and then we'll have a discussion about some of those issues that will pop out of that and I'm pretty sure it will be a very interesting one. So Thomas, floor is yours, please enlighten us. Thank you very much uh, Robert. It's a pleasure to be part of that. Uh, I think we have to limit it uh, because to talk about Liechtenstein would cover our 40 minutes easily. Uh, my name is Thomas Nagel. I'm, as I said, attorney at law in Liechtenstein. Um, I, I used to code software for about 10 years. And um, I think what is worth noting is that I was a part of the work group of the Liechtenstein government actually drafting that piece of uh, legislation you were referring to, the, the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act, uh, or it's uh, also called, actually the name is TVTG. Um, and uh, it's it's better known under the term blockchain act so in Liechtenstein, uh, uh, we are a part uh, of the european economic area that's i think uh, very crucial to understand so we are not part of the european union but we are part of the european uh, economic area so most of the uh, financial market laws are applicable here as well and uh, in Liechtenstein, we started actually 2016 that work group and uh, the idea of that work group is uh, to first of all understand what is happening because we had uh, some some ico projects back then uh, to, to understand what is happening and uh, if regulation is needed and if yes, uh, how, like which, which way uh, and how we actually can uh, um, answer these questions we have. And in the end, um, the idea was to provide legal certainty to, uh, for the entrepreneurs. That's on, on the one hand and on the other hand, for sure. Uh, the idea was also uh, to, to address issues like investor protections and, and, and a lot of other questions. Um, and what is really different from a lot of other approaches I saw so far is that it is a very, very comprehensive approach. Uh, we, we heard in, in, in the last talk uh, that, for example, the civil law uh, questions are not addressed uh, in, in, in jurisdictions yet, or at least that I'm, I'm not aware of, of such a comprehensive um, um, approach. Uh, and Liechtenstein started uh, from scratch and said, okay, uh, if we really want to understand the technology and what's so beneficial, uh, we came to the conclusion that a new regulatory approach is needed. Um, and uh, Liechtenstein ended up with uh, this uh, piece of legislation, as I said, uh, in the center, we, we call that token container model, where a token can actually represent any right. And based on that concept, uh, you can build up uh, what we call token economy. And this is to provide the legal, uh, the legal framework for the token economy, which uh, answers a lot of questions, which will actually cover, we will, we will have to talk hours about that, but it also covers civil law aspects. It, 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 uh, uh, it deals with uh, supervisory aspects. It deals with uh, a lot of um, other uh, regulatory aspects. For sure, money laundering, KYC, and AML is, is covered. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, very comprehensive piece of legislation. We have that in force now since 1st of January. We have a lot of uh, um, like requests back. As we, we started 1st of January uh, 2020. Now we have a lot of requests uh, for uh, uh, companies who want to actually start to operate out of Liechtenstein, not only exchanges, but the, they are actually the ones who, who are interested to operate out of Europe and they, they check which jurisdictions actually offer licenses or, or registrations and uh, provide legal clarity how to operate the business. Um, 
but we have 11 other service providers uh, which you can actually register in Liechtenstein and most of the attraction uh, or, or most of the interest is actually um, in this area but uh, and I will stop there uh, for example we also heard about NFTs NFTs is something we discussed quite like in the beginning and it's also like it's nothing special for us it falls under our legislation as well so I, I will stop here sorry I, I don't want to take too much time so we have a, a good discussion afterwards Thanks, Thomas. I think uh, there's a lot to follow up on, uh, which is uh, very interesting. And uh, Jennifer, uh, you're sitting in Switzerland. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit about uh, how the Swiss government uh, tried to solve, uh, you know, the mystery of crypto? Well, um, Switzerland took a bit of a different approach uh, from Liechtenstein. Um, Basically, what we decided is that um, there didn't need to be one all-encompassing law, but instead um, 10 existing laws um, were amended um, earlier this year. Basically, the thought was that the technology is ever and fast developing, and um, basically we wouldn't be able to keep up, and there was no need for a fundamental change. And already kind of with the existing law, there was enough flexibility um, to just have targeted um, amendments. Then um, there was also a lot of pushback whether there should be regulations or um, making Switzerland um, an attractive place for, for DLT and blockchain projects if there should be no regulation at all. But in the end, um, to, to save or uh, protect the reputation of uh, Switzerland and its uh, financial marketplace, um, th these targeted laws were put into place. Um, in true Swiss uh, fashion, um, uh, Switzerland shows a technology neutral approach um, where um, the technologies aren't specifically named, but more its characteristics, which would also justify the same treatment as some um, certificates and securities. Um, the government is always in exchange with the industry to kind of watch out for the changes and also um, see how it can um, deal with those um, new developments. Now, what Switzerland did um, was create a, a blanket framework, uh, which had the objective of increasing legal certainty in civil law with regard to the transfer of rights via a manipulation safe electronic register, also insolvency law questions with regard to segregation of, um, of crypto-based assets in case of bankruptcy, um, and also um, creating a new authorization type uh, for blockchain-based financial market infrastructures. Now, the big change that came into place um, is, is with regards to the certificates law. Um, Switzerland decided uh, to place distributed ledgers, which based um, on the will of many users reflect uh, the rights and makes them tradable within the certificates law. So the objective was to create a secure legal basis for the trading of rights through electronic registers. Now, this only pertains to um, tokens with, which represent um, a legal position, such as claim, uh, claims, memberships, uh, rights in REM. And um, as a result, uh, these new so-called ledger-based securities um, were created, which are then recorded in this uh, securities ledgers. And um, if they meet all the, the, uh, the regulatory requirements, they then have the function of um, kind of safeguarding the transfer function, that, um, that you have the guarantee that those rights are also transferred if they're transferred um, on the distributed ledger. Also, the proof of entitlement, which is also visible. And and um, also the protection of the transactions that the parties may rely on such rights and um, entitlements. And uh, then lastly, as I mentioned, there's also a new financial market infrastructure type for crypto-based um, assets, which um, is a new trading venue, um, allows retail clients to participate and um, focuses on the DLT securities, but also other digital assets such as payment tokens and utility tokens. So we're, we're quite at the beginning here. All um, Part of the amendments came into place in February with regard to the civil law. Um, the last amendments came into place in August and now um, at Signum we've also taken advantage of these amendments and um, based all our tokenization projects on these new ledger-based uh, securities because now we, we finally have this, this legal certainty that the transfer of the tokens which are the native digital sec uh, securities that it actually is a transfer of the underlying asset and you don't have this uncertainty of the, the contractual um, um, connection, which has been very exciting and also um, kind of uh, we've, we've seen that it's gained a lot of traction, the tokenization projects and um, Switzerland as a place um, to come for such service offerings. 
Thanks for the intro into Switzerland, uh, Jennifer. And I would like to go now to my Austrian colleague. Um, you're basically, so we just heard basically what happens outside the EU and uh, Austria is a mid-sized member of uh, the European Union. You know, we're not as big as Germany. And I'm pretty sure Ali Reza will elaborate uh, the benefits of being so big uh, a bit in, in a couple of minutes. I just would like to ask you, um, uh, Raphael, about the, the benefits of being at a place like Austria compared to like Switzerland or Germany. Is there something that uh, you know we can uh, bring to the table that is uh, a bit more nimble, or is it, a, or is there still a look uh, or, a, or an approach where we just wait for the European level? Maybe that would be uh, good to elaborate a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm working at Brandel Tausch in Vienna, and we're advising uh, companies on capital markets for a number of years. Um, and the capital markets and securities regulation play a very important role when it comes to crypto regulation in Austria, which is mostly driven by the EU. So what basically happened in Austria, and this is something that distinguishes us from a number of other member states, is that, or probably not, doesn't distinguish us too much, is that most of the time we wait for an EU regulation to come, and then we just transpose it most of the time last minute or even after the last minute into Austrian law. And if we're not particularly motivated, from time to time, we tend to just copy what happens in Germany. Um, this happened to some extent when it comes to the crypto regulation frameworks, uh, which in Austria, first of all, have been mostly looked at from a securities law perspective. And everyone was wondering, well, how does it work in the existing security frameworks? And uh, Lucas already mentioned at the very first panel, the MIF2 regulation, which of course is the most elaborate uh, framework in this regard. And so the initial look was, how does it fit into this framework? And then I was thinking, well, securities, it doesn't depend whether they're written on paper, on blockchain, by an email, or however. As long as they contain the typical elements of the security, it is a security. And thus, all discussions have been muted relatively quickly. And then the kind of remainder, in particular payment token, utility token, that did not fall within the classical scope of securities, uh, have not been <coughs> regulated to a specific extent, which of course caused a lot of confusion because a lot of regulations or a lot of uh, ancient laws, if you want to say so, were not really cut out for it. For example, under Austrian law, everything that is not a person is being considered a good. And so everyone was taking, well, it is obvious, for example, Bitcoins are goods um, because they're not qualifying as securities, which of course raised a lot more questions than it answered. Um, so following this, um, we have seen a little bit of pushback and uh, in particular legal discussions on this, but it was mostly driven by an academic discussion um, and of course by a tax law discussion because the financial ministry was very interested and intrigued on how it could tax all these developments. Um, and so apart from that and apart from the security discussion, there hasn't been too much movement. Um, the only major change that came into play was with the transposal of the fourth and fifth AML directive, in particular the fifth AML directive, which all of a sudden um, required Austrian law also to provide for possibility or regulation of certain service providers. But then this regulation, <laughs> sorry, was mostly looked at from an AML perspective. So now we have a number of service providers, but they're only being regulated out of <laughs> an email perspective, which again, does not give too much comfort and only provides for a rather limited amount of regulation. Um, at the same time, and nevertheless, and this is probably something that comes as a surprise, um, Austria has been pushing forward and has had some kind of first uh, applications um, that where we have been quicker than other member states. For example, the first uh, prospectus that was issued for a token, for a security token, happened in Austria already in 2000, if I recall correctly, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And at the same time, and this is something where preceded the European regulation, we have already established a regulatory sandbox at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, trying to give young startups the opportunity to not go through the whole licensing process and at the same time being able to test their product in a market-like environment. Now this sounded, 
as a very good idea to start. But there was a lot of pushback, in particular from consumer protection agencies, which said this is an approach that should not be taken. And thus, this very good idea that started out now led to a basically prolonged license process, which means that companies that, for example, offer securities and it would need for a security token and would as such need a security license or a MIFID license, can now go through the process with the guidance of the FMA but have the Financial Markets Authority uh, sitting longer in the company and looking at the beginning <coughs> of the process and in particular providing guidance further even after the license has been granted, which makes the whole process more cumbersome and less market friendly as one would have expected at the very first glance. So we'll see <coughs> how this development will proceed in particular now with what is happening on an EU basis. Um, but in order and to come back to your question, I think what helped is, or what helped from an Austrian perspective was that EU law provides a lot of cornerstones, um, but the gaps that are left in between are still something that has left to be answered. Um, and where as long as the BAFE in Germany has provided any conclusive arguments or ideas, most of the times uh, we will have to, or the market participants will try to have to figure out solutions to uh, regulatory challenges themselves. Thank you for the elaboration. Uh, Ali Reza, um, we already heard uh, Germany mentioned quite often uh, in the last minutes. So I uh, would like to ask you to give an overview about uh, Germany's position on the regulation towards crypto assets and everything that's linked to it. And maybe also if you could elaborate, because you're not only drivers, obviously, at the EU level, but also globally. Um, but particularly in Europe, uh, the voice of Germany is uh, immensely strong. What are the drivers in Germany to push for certain types of regulation? Because when we listen to Switzerland and Liechtenstein, uh, there, there are certain differences. And it would be, I think, interesting uh, also for the audience to know is like, why does Germany and therefore also Europe does the, the regulation of uh, crypto assets or blockchain applications at least to a certain extent a bit different and sometimes maybe a bit more stricter than other places. Thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here today and thanks to Riddle & Code for organizing this uh, great event. So, um, as, as my dear colleagues already explained a lot about regulation in Switzerland, Liechtenstein and Austria, I, I do not have too much more to add to that, uh, but I can say that the, the German regulation is actually seen in an international perspective as a gold standard. So the gold standard means that whatever Germany is doing, uh, the other jurisdictions will follow in the end. I can tell it to you from, from two perspectives. From one perspective, since I'm a lawyer with Anneton, but from a second perspective, because I'm also active as an expert in the lawmaking procedures, not just on a domestic and a German level, but also on the EU level. As my dear colleague Mark already from INAPA explained the Mika consultation, this was also done with a task force in Mika where I, at INAPA where I was also involved. Uh, and also I was involved in the lawmakings in Germany, especially the implementation of the Anti-Money Laundering direct, uh, Directive 5, the MLD5, and also the new law which we have in Germany, which is the law on the introduction of the so-called electronic securities. Uh, this was done with the German Bundesblock, but also with the Think Block Tank, where I am part with uh, Thomas Nigle, but also with Nina Sita, who will talk later today. So given all of that, uh, I think it's also important to look from an historical perspective. So Germany was the first jurisdiction, which in 2014, uh, so straight after the Financial Action Task Force, by the end of 2013, uh, gave some warning, warnings towards cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies at that time, especially with focus on Bitcoin. So the German regulator Bafin already in 2014 said that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are regulated. So this standpoint has not changed until now. So this is like still effective. But what Germany did during the time, Germany took the MLD5 and implemented it in two ways. First of all, Germany gave the definition of crypto assets. So it gave a definition to the German Banking Act of crypto assets. And this definition or this uh, procedure was actually also kind of a blueprint for the Mika. So if you look at the Mika definition at uh, crypto assets and then the German definition, they are very similar. 
even though both are going back to the FATF recommendations on the definition of virtual currencies or virtual assets. But still, Germany was the first jurisdiction within the European Union, within the European economic area, which took crypto assets and defined it. So this is first thing what they did. The second thing what Germany did, they added to the existing list of services of banking and financial services, the so-called crypto custody service provider. So this is a license where you all have seen uh, not just German uh, uh, players in the market have applied for, but also Coinbase, which got the first license, uh, the first crypto custody license, uh, also from a global perspective. So there's no other jurisdiction where you get this kind of license. So they, they did it, they got it in Germany and many will follow. Uh, this is the, the second approach what, what Germany did. So they didn't just do the, the definition of crypto assets and crypto asset service provider from an AML perspective, but also from a regulation perspective, from the banking regulation perspective. And also if you look to Mika, not just a crypto, crypto asset service provider is listed in the Mika as a service, as a regulated service, but also similar other things what the German regulator is doing. So this again is a blueprint for the EA perspective, for the European Economic Area perspective on regulation. And the third thing what Germany did now is, as I said in the beginning, the implementation of the new law which is covering the electronic securities. This goes direction civil law, this goes direction TFTG, so the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act. We now look at the civil law. And what Germany is doing here with the civil law is that introducing the possibility to issue um, token uh, or crypto assets on the blockchain without the need of a deed or paper and to trade it on the blockchain by also introducing a so-called register keeper. And this register keeper is similar to the idea of what the TVDG is doing for the Liechtenstein law, what also Switzerland was doing already with the Buch effect and so on. So Germany was looking at Liechtenstein, was looking at Switzerland and was putting up something which uh, is now introducing the possibility to introduce and to issue Vera bonds, but also in the future, uh, and also already now actually, to also issue fund shares. So you can also put fund shares on the blockchain. And this is now going to also develop not by tokenizing or putting like your, your shares on the blockchain, but also you have a new law which is specifically focusing on, on the funds, on the funds industry, on the asset management industry, which allows the funds and also the asset managers to invest in crypto. So you can also see in Germany, a couple of uh, funds and a couple of uh, asset managers who have set up funds, special funds, which invest in cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is, from my point of view, actually boring. What's now developing is also funds which going to uh, invest in DeFi and decentralized finance. This is interesting. This is going to come and what Germany is also doing now already. So the German regulator BaFin already has a paper on the regulation of NFTs. And also this again, this regulation of NFTs, uh, I believe that Mika is going to have the same position as a German lawmaker on how to regulate NFTs. So this again is a blueprint for the European Union and the European economic area. And as you can see from the global perspective, as you just asked Robert, if you look at the SEC or FinCEN, which is looking into DeFi, how to regulate DeFi and looking into players such as Coinbase, uh, I believe uh, strongly that even the US regulators they're looking at the German market and looking how Germany is doing it. And I believe also looking at the time, this is probably enough for now to just put it like, as I said in the beginning, Germany is the gold standard. And as Frank Sinatra once saying, if you do it in Germany, you actually do it in any jurisdiction. Thanks for this last uh, word that I think pretty much summed the modesty up of Germany. I know that you guys are doing a great job. I just would like to give it now to our Swiss and Liechtenstein colleagues uh, to do the obvious thing and obviously agree uh, with the Germans. And uh, so maybe Thomas, should Liechtenstein copy everything Germany is doing <laughs> or do you think you have better ideas? Ali Reze is a very good friend of mine. So it's, uh, we, we discuss uh, things quite intensely. And uh, uh, besides that, as, as lawyers, we don't agree all the time uh, with, with our ideas and our perspectives uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, not only if you are friends or if you work in the same industry, uh, you don't have to work in uh, two different jurisdictions to have different opinions. Uh, I, I think even, even if you're working in the same jurisdiction, you have different opinions. And here we have, I, I think, a, a quite uh, different opinion. 
Um, but uh, I think uh, every, every approach, and be it in Switzerland, Germany, Liechtenstein, Austria, wherever, even if you don't do anything, is actually valuable for the industry. Because you learn, uh, because even if you decide not to regulate it, you do something, you make a decision. And I think that's valuable for the overall discussion. I think what is good now that even if you don't do anything, uh, you are forced to answer the question why you don't work on a piece of legislation, why you don't regulate it. And I think that's a good thing. So we are heard. That's that's actually that's actually uh, which is uh, which we share. Uh, which I think everybody could agree on that uh, this is this is uh, something which is good. Um, in respect to um, to Mika, I think I can add here something from the Liechtenstein perspective because uh, not only uh, uh, as was Germany in, in talks with the European Commission, we were in, in intense talks with the European Commission as well. And I uh, published actually a paper about the comparison of Mika and the TVTG, analyzed the different uh, licenses and registrations, and what is similar and what is actually the regulation level. And I think that um, also the definition, for example, of the token uh, uh, of, uh, um, in, in Mika and uh, how we approach that uh, is quite similar as well. So I think and um, uh, that is something uh, which European Commission uh, Joachim Schwerin, that's his private opinion, but I can quote him here, uh, uh, said at uh, events in Liechtenstein that they also analyzed the Liechtenstein fr framework quite intensely because it was uh, one of the most comprehensive ones. And I think uh, that Mika is in, in, in quite a lot of areas uh, heavily influenced uh, by the Liechtenstein legislation. And I think that's actually quite interesting now that you see that, um, uh, that for example, like the first security token offering we did in, in, in August 2018. And uh, since then we did not only uh, bonds, we also had uh, equity uh, instruments offered uh, and passported to the European Union. Uh, when it comes to funds, for example, as Ali Reza said that they're working on, on the legislation there, uh, we did that uh, we should the first time uh, uh, fund shares of an AIF uh, in, in uh, actually end of 2019 and uh, our uh, financial market authority issued guidelines how to do that based on that. They should also guidelines uh, actually after uh, the first uh, security token offering we did, uh, where they got a prospectus approved and passported it to the European Union uh, uh, in 2018, I think, or 2019 it was. Um, so you see that uh, uh, you have like, and that's actually the, uh, the good thing here, that the German speaking part is really pushing things forward, be it Germany, be it Switzerland, be it Liechtenstein. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's what we can, can share here. Uh, but we have a little bit different opinion who, who actually influenced whom. Uh, my personal opinion is I don't care as long as we have like good regulatory approaches and not bad ones. And that starts with getting educated, look what others did. And I think I feel a little bit that this is happening now. And I think that's a good thing. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Jennifer, if you want to comment from a Swiss perspective, then please do so. Yeah, no, um, I fully agree. I think in the end, it just also kind of depends on the foundation that you're building um, upon. And I'm um, just kind of, um, especially in Switzerland, seeing all these amendments that were made. In the end, the foundation was already there. There was a lot of equivalency that could be used. So really kind of there was no need to reinvent the, the wheel there. So really it was kind of that was also the approach of Switzerland that really each law was looked at specifically and um, checked what changes had to be made. Um, sometimes it was just a matter of clarification, so not even a real change and kind of already a general understanding that that's how the law should be interpreted as it was still broad, in, broad enough. Um, and um, in other cases, there were really specific changes made. Um, in other cases, there was also pushback from the industry um, where, where the regulator just said that kind of there isn't um, enough experience there and that there are kind of developments that are still going to be watched closely and monitored. So kind of at this point, nothing is set in stone. And I think that's kind of the approach that Switzerland went with that kind of with our foundation that we had a lot that we could already do with our um, intermediated securities um, law and also kind of also for tokenization projects that also already gave us the flexibility of also um, tokenizing foreign shares, for example. And um, now um, we, we've just kind of added these, these new categories and um, kind of just um, described 
described them and kind of also left it open enough for all developments to come. But um, at this point, uh, Switzerland is also clearly stating that um, it's open and it's it's um, also very aware that um, that things are changing very fast and um, it has to be monitored uh, very closely and further changes um, may and probably will be uh, necessary uh, down the road. Um, but at this at this point, kind of with very minor uh, changes, it was possible to kind of cover um, all the needs um, that are there, kind of in relate, uh, kind of um, in relation to to kind of all these all these developments. But obviously, Switzerland is always closely um, watching its neighbors and seeing what it can take and apply um, to its own framework. But still, um, as we're not part of the EU and our framework is very different, it also wouldn't be possible to apply everything the same way. So kind of, in my opinion, it's always kind of what's the jumping off point, what's already put in place um, and kind of building upon that and kind of doing something that makes sense within uh, that ecosystem. Thanks, Jennifer. Um... A question to you, Raphael, um, as you're a legal expert on this issue uh, and you're looking at the developments in MECAR and you see what's going on in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, how do you see it, this playing out in the future? You know, MECAR has a potential implementation timeline for end of 2023, 2024. From, from uh, what you've seen and experienced in the last years and sitting in, in Vienna, which uh, has a, a number of uh, great companies in the space, what do you think will happen in the next two years? How will they work all together? How will the market react to this now uh, springing up um, regulations? Yeah, um, I think at least from a, from a regulatory perspective, or from an Austrian perspective, it's all a little bit wait and see now, uh, because everyone is aware that Mika is coming, but Mika still has a kind of rather <laughs> broad and to some extent unclear uh, scope of, uh, of application. Um, so a lot of market participants are not in a very comfortable position that they want to push forward, but that the law is just not clear cut out and so you're running into the risk of provide services that you might need a license for in two and three years. So we've seen two different <laughs> approaches for this. There's one kind of market participants who say, okay, we understand that at least now in Austria, this is not a very safe environment to push something forward. So we'd rather go to, to Swiss or Liechtenstein uh, and try something out there. And the, the other half of the market participants probably say, well, it now being an early adopter phase, it might even be easier to establish market standards now and to push the regulator in a certain direction. And I think and this is something that, that also Thomas pointed out, that as soon as you have, or as soon as you are the first one who's pushing for a license or for a prospectus in that regard, <laughs> and you are one of the first one to run through the process, you're also having the unique opportunity to influence how the regulator treats the whole process and how guidances or guidelines that the regulator publishes uh, will be influenced. And so I think that there are some market uh, participants that now see this <coughs> as a testing area where they can just go for it. And I mentioned briefly before that as of now, the services and licenses that you may provide in Austria are either those under the MIFID uh, license regime, which is rather clear cut out, or those under the AML directive. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and the latter ones are kind of a little bit in the gray area. For example, there is a, a license that you can acquire for services or for financial services being provided with regard to virtual currencies. And now what virtual currencies are or aren't are kind of clear because the regulator wanted to regulate bitcoins and the like. What's not clear is what financial services are that might be provided toward virtual currencies. And so now whenever you talk with the, re <laughs> the regulator, you have the unique opportunity to kind of further detail it and further work out. <laughs> Sorry for that. It's not, it's not COVID. I can reassure everyone, but um, yeah. Um, and so you have had a unique opportunity to kind of assist the regulator in detailing it, what it should be or shouldn't be. And as long as you bring good arguments, you have the opportunity to uh, make your stamp here and to, to influence it. Um, and that's why Mika will come and Mika will bring with it a lot of changes. Uh, being an early adopter here might give companies the, the unique edge to, to influence the whole market at a very early stage and just drive 
developments uh, very far in the future. Thanks, Raphael. I'm very glad it's not COVID. Um, as we unfortunately have, to, uh, <laughs> very good. As we unfortunately have come to an end, I would like to ask everybody for a very short answer to a hopefully good question. Um, you know, we, we basically just covered in a nutshell the Dach region. What if you're uh, Imagine you were sitting uh, together with a company that uh, looks at this place, 100 million people, exciting place, a lot of innovation going on, and they want to come here. What would you tell them uh, from a legal perspective of the one thing they should take care of before they launch here as a, a new company in the space? What would be your advice? Maybe we start uh, with Liechtenstein. What would be your advice to a company that comes to the Dach region? Including Liechtenstein. <laughs> so Dachli then. <laughs> Dachli, exactly. <laughs> choose your jurisdiction wisely. Um, I think uh, that's that's uh, you should really uh, do the, uh, put a lot of effort in choosing your jurisdiction wisely before you because if you start somewhere, it's very hard to move your company to another jurisdiction. And this has a lot of consequences. And I don't tell everybody, come to Liechtenstein, that's the best place. That's not the, that's not the case. Uh, it, sometimes it makes more sense to do that in Switzerland. Sometimes it makes more sense to do that in Germany or in Austria or wherever. Just, uh, just like uh, do your homework before, before you settle somewhere and uh, think a little bit what is coming, uh, what is your target market, uh, what are the products and services you want to offer, and what is crucial for you. Uh, do you want to have a friendly regulator, an open-minded regulator, uh, which, open, like, which wants to discuss with you, which is, I think, the case in, in, in quite a, a lot. I cannot quote on, 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 on Bafin, but I think in Austria that's the case. I, I know that uh, that's the case in Switzerland. Um, and I think, uh, Ali Reza, you told me that uh, Buffin is getting better and better and they're, they're, they're open to discussion, I think. So choose your jurisdiction wisely in one sentence. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, I can, I can only concur. I think in the end, it really depends on, on kind of the services you want to offer and, and kind of being able to reconcile that with um, the jurisdiction and kind of um, what the, the regulatory landscape is that, that makes the most sense because I don't think that it's also necessarily kind of the place that has the least uh, regulation because um, I think kind of there, I think more and more I'm also seeing that people are also seeing the value of kind of being duly regulated and kind of being able to go out into the market and kind of show there is certainty and um, that uh, they've been thoroughly vetted and they're they're adhering to certain standards. So um, I, I think there are a lot of considerations to be made uh, depending on the, the respective business model. Thanks, Jennifer. Raphael, with your last Yeah, I, I can fully agree. And, um, and I think, and this is the point that the deep edge is not only look at the jurisdiction you are trying or, or make your consideration of jurisdiction is the best, also from a tax perspective, um, but also think really about the regulator you want to work with, uh, because whether the, the regulator really can, if you want to make your life very easy and be an understanding partner in your registration process and being a licensed entity, or it can make your life very hard. And so I think assessing the regulator as well as the legal environment, in particular in light of all the upcoming changes, might be one of the core issues to, to think about. Thanks, Rafael. And uh, last but not least, Ali Reza. I would actually tell them the same, which I'm telling my clients since 2014. Uh, most of those exchanges, which you all uh, uh, know of, but which names I'm not uh, calling now, um, but you should look at the strategic perspective. You should look at what is happening in the next years, where do you want to stay for the next years, where's your target market, what do you want to make use of? And you should not limit yourself to say, okay, I'm going to Liechtenstein or I'm going to Germany or I'm going to Switzerland. You can make use of lots of possibilities. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can choose your, your jurisdiction, but also your, your, your market and your, your services in, in a way. So you're not just having a, your a quick solution, but a long lasting strategic solution. And I believe this is very important to, to make this preparation in advance and not to, to, to do things too quickly and then later on realize that you did something wrong and then try to catch up everything again. Uh, and I think this is uh, the best uh, advice or suggestion I can give to anyone internationally looking to enter the European market. On that uh, note, uh, I think uh, we can end our discussions. Thanks for all your time, guys. Uh, great discussion.
as you can see, they're all experts. So whenever you want to go to one of those jurisdictions, I'm pretty sure they will be happy to enlighten you even more. And on this note, uh, Sebastian, I think I'll hand over to you again. And I thank my panel. And uh, yeah, if you have any follow-up questions, then I'm pretty sure everybody will be happy to answer them on LinkedIn or any other channels. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot, Robert. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. And of course, we are happy to collect your questions in the chat box uh, and maybe uh, jump back to uh, some of the points at the end of this webinar and the Q&A uh, session. So without uh, much further ado, I'd like to invite my two fellow Fireside Chat panelists to uh, the stage now, Jacek Trimmel. He's heading um, business development, especially in the German speaking markets for our partner coin firm and also Barbara Halasek. Uh, she's heading regulatory uh, affairs at coin firm. And let's use the next 15 minutes to look at the market from a, from a technical and service providers perspective. Uh, something we, we have in common, uh, kind of we as the kind of, you know, infrastructure and stack guys and you as the application specialists um, and uh, forensic specialists in, in the wider sense. And, you know, it's just looking to the, the, the political debate in Germany here before the election of the top candidates of the big parties two days ago. Um, and even there, you know, Buffin plays a role because of Wirecard, uh, of course, and, and the scandal um, that we, we saw here, not only in Germany, but in Munich, where I live. Um, and we should maybe beat the drum a little bit for blockchain technology because, you know, uh, something like um, Wirecard and the way this was unfolding, um, it might be quite difficult uh, to, you know, to see something like this again, if uh, everything in that sector would be based on blockchain technology. So my first question to you uh, would be, um, do you see um, new regulatory regimes and also stricter regulation as a driver for your business and for also for uh, the market's getting more mature or how do you perceive the, the European patchwork at least that we have and the waiting time uh, until, you know, things like Mika come into place? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for having us. Um, yes, we definitely see this as a driver and thank you for bringing up this uh, example with our card. Um, uh, the changing and shifting regulation in the crypto space definitely helped uh, CoinFirm to become a leading AML provider in the crypto space, specifically in the DAC region, working with the major exchanges, custodians, uh, wallet providers, payment gateways, etc. cetera. Um, before the regulations came into place, it seemed uh, pretty much uh, that the situation was quite uh, similar to what we have seen or had seen before because it's now changing also in the DeFi space. Mainly uh, what I mean by that is that uh, the AML uh, KYC requirements used to be uh, in the old days subject to uh, discretion of uh, the existing VASPs at that time. Um, some of them that entered the field uh, pr pretty early and were already obliged institutions at the, under the law at that time, such as for example, Börse Stuttgart, obviously perceived their uh, obligations as valid to comply with the regulations also uh, in relation to crypto assets. Uh, at the same time, um, this entered the, the field also to some more shady businesses that uh, were not really strictly applying to KYC ML. This was, for, uh, of course, a trigger for a de-risking of uh, crypto by a traditional finance. Uh, it was a no-go uh, area back then. Of course, with AMLD5 and uh, the local regulations, especially in Germany, um, we've seen on the one hand that uh, the previously existing VASPs uh, actually had uh, rising uh, um, AML requirements, KYC requirements. Um, also, they were subject to licensing. At the same time, this opened uh, also the space to the traditional finance. Uh, because the uh, equal requirements were set for both the traditional financial institutions as well as uh, for e any early stage startups uh, that wanted to enter the crypto space. Um, if I am to call out some international case study uh, in this uh, particular topic, I would uh, perhaps uh, use this opportunity as today uh, there is an important date for Cardano uh, hitting the uh, smart contract. Uh, on the public testnet. Um, I think um, there was um, before uh, some 
a lack of understanding of what AML really is on crypto. Is it uh, really possible, right? Uh, is the blockchain technology um, really uh, anonymous? And in a such sense, is it possible to do any AML KYC uh, on it? Um, obviously, um, this is a topic for a separate uh, webinar, I would say, with the transparency of blockchain as an opportunity and anonymity as a, as a risk in general. Uh, however, uh, what is important to be understood is that definitely AML is possible. Uh, it is possible for traditional financial institutions to uh, be compliant with AML regulations. At the same time, it's different to traditional finance in the sense that it's not just a simple set of rules, right? It's uh, actually uh, all um, other aspects related to data extraction from the nodes. Uh, you need to apply a separate AML methodology for each and every individual uh, blockchain and protocol. And Cardano is obviously a good example of that uh, with uh, CoinFirm announcing partnership with Cardano recently uh, this month. Uh, we are actually right now the only AML provider for uh, Cardano ADA and also uh, related smart contracts coming soon. So in that sense, uh, of course, uh, there is a huge uh, educational aspect uh, and um, for, for the traditional finance. At the same time, um, it is very important to understand that yes, there are solutions. Both governments now know that uh, it is possible to also comply with the licensing requirements for AML for specific blockchains. At the same time, this educational piece is in, uh, important because right now we obviously have VASPs interacting with ADA, but do they really uh, do AML on ADA if they are not using providers doing that? Right, so that's interesting case study maybe for also a separate topic. Yeah, let's maybe look at uh, one or two niches. So we've seen it with our customer base in the Netherlands where let's say quite a relatively strict regulation was adopted a few months ago and immediately uh, it was forcing especially the new service provider or WASPs as you call them um, to, to you know, ramp up uh, their game. Yeah? So all of a sudden, everything that we provide, like, you know, segregated wallets and complete audit trails that, you know, come from our history to work as a audited and certified um, service provider in, in, in the Swiss financial market, that was, of course, extremely in demand. And now we, we've seen, for example, in Germany, where now uh, institutional funds are allowed to also uh, you know, add crypto to their portfolio. Um, what kinds of requests are you getting uh, from the segment of, for example, funds in the German speaking market? Is there something you can, you know, mention? Yes, definitely. Uh, there is um, a specific uh, um, angle to that, namely, um, not all funds that are now allowed to invest into crypto assets on behalf of their clients are necessarily interested to hold also custody over crypto because uh, while doing so, obviously they would be obliged to comply with AML requirements. Um, for this, uh, there is also interest in the market uh, to, uh, in different models. For example, using other liquidity providers, uh, third parties for this, using third party custody providers, um, partnering with third party institutions that are already existing in the space, rather than uh, opening uh, own compliance uh, departments dedicated to crypto assets. As such, uh, what I would call out as a, a development in that respect is interest or demand in access to some sources of information uh, about the um, uh, credibility of certain partners, uh, but also in the DeFi space, which is a huge opportunity for crypto funds, where uh, crypto funds need to understand which uh, what are the differences between different liquidity pools, for example, uh, which of them uh, bear more risk than others, and the same applies to partners. So uh, we at CoinFirm are interested to develop such libraries, registries, uh, to, to, to provide this kind of information also for this type of clients. Um, so this I would call out as a specific uh, also um, development in market that we see. In uh, addition to that, of course, education, right? So there is a need for education and that coin from, of course, we're open to collaborate on that. That would also be my next question to you. 
Barbara, we heard our colleagues from the law firms in the panel before to talk about, you know, if there is a greenfield project, and we know that we talk about, you know, decentralized, not only finance, but also corporate setups. So sometimes there's more of a choice for, you know, where to uh, place your company or where to register your service than in previous times. So if you have these kinds of discussions, and if, if uh, clients approach you to talk about, you know, which market might be the best, what's your advice? Sure. Um, so echoing what our colleagues said, um, there's um, there's um, well, let's say smart way of choosing your jurisdiction where you look at the business opportunities and where you look what makes sense for your business, what is the best um, setup for your business, the most efficient setup for your business. But there is also a second type of jurisdictional arbitrage, which we are still seeing in discussions with the with the market players or new entrants into the market, which is uh, coming back to the question, where do I set up my business to avoid uh, AML, to avoid KYC, to avoid regulation? And that is something that uh, we still tend to see even though the regulations are developing and even though I think many of us here in our in that call are aware of the fact that the regulations are coming. It's not a question of um, whether they will be applicable. It's more of a question of how they will be applicable. So looking at the jurisdiction, I would not, first of all, I would not look at what jurisdiction has no AML laws or has no regulations for tokenization, rather than um, I would look at which regulation is most favorable for my business model. The reason for that is, uh, well, looking long, long term, exactly echoing um, what our colleagues said, um, strategic thinking, looking at where your business is going and looking at the risks that choosing a regulation, regulation sorry, jurisdiction with low AML regulation will bring to you. Um, an example of that is issuing your tokens in a jurisdiction which does not have um, regulatory framework legal certainty at the moment and um, that step will come into place that will appear in future and then at, at that point you're running the risk of well looking at your client base and well looking at the problem after the problem appeared rather than preventing the problem so in a way doing the reactive approach rather being rather than being proactive and uh, taking care of your risks before they emerge and if you're now planning a service and, and you know that you will launch in, I don't know, 12 to 18 months, for example, a utility token, uh, what's your advice? What should you do in the meantime? How can you get up to speed with, you know, understanding not only existing but upcoming regulatory plans? Sure, uh, that's a very valid point. And uh, we have so many ways at the moment, especially with the um, with the globalization network and with the with the um, well internet um, uh, facilities and uh, associations uh, for for blockchains. So uh, first of all, um, knowledge sharing and uh, networking, making sure that you're staying abreast of anything that is developing in the jurisdiction you're looking at, but also other jurisdictions. The reason for that is, um, as we've um, as we've seen um, before, um, jurisdictions tend to speak to each other and um, see what has worked in a different country and try to utilize what has been proven as effective. Therefore, looking at what has been developed in other countries may give you a feeling of uh, which is the direction your country, your jurisdiction may um, follow in the future as well. And to the previous point about associations and networking, um, the, the prominent example of INADVA, of course, uh, there are more associations um, for blockchain industry where you're open, you, you can have not only sort of a formal discussion, but also informal discussion with, with the colleagues in the network to see what others are doing, what is the uh, standard, what are the trends in the industry. And, um, and to that point as well, the importance of um, having participating in public private sector dialogue. So again, uh, to the point that Mark was um, mentioning in the very beginning, there are channels for um, for expressing the feedback from the private industry to the public on the regulations. And um, this is something that is still, I believe, um, underutilized. Um, looking at your experience, is there any specific uh, file or paper that you can recommend that people should look at right now? Um, anything that came out of one of the markets? Right. Um, there's there there's loads uh, of of different papers depending on uh, really what you are 
what you are interested in. Is it a regulation um, at a broader sense or is it specific AML regulation? The most recent one that comes into my mind is the um, World Economic Forum uh, paper on the regulatory approaches um, for crypto. I think it came out literally last week. Uh, it's a very consist uh, concise um, really a few pages uh, paper talking about different approaches that regulators take to regulating crypto um, and also uh, looking at um, um, not only the, the regulatory approaches but also the, the benefits and advantages um, of uh, taking a, a different, uh, well, a specific regulatory approach. So if anyone is interested, I can share the link later on in the chat and really recommend getting familiar with that. Okay, thanks a lot, Barbara. And maybe last question to you, Jacek. Uh, we all know that the crypto market is, you know, uh, developing at a fast uh, pace. You know, uh, DeFi was, you know, just a small little movement until 12, 18 months ago when it really took off. Um, so if you start of thinking a new service and you need to, you know, um, hire some vendors, what's from your point of view, the value in tapping into partners that are pre-integrated like ourselves, for example, but certainly we're not, you know, having an exclusive partnership. So everybody needs to work with everybody. Uh, but is there room for cherry picking or are pre-existing, let's say modules and partnerships uh, to be preferred from your point of view? If you quickly need to set up your backend and get ready for, you know, inspection or AML compliance. Yes, absolutely, Sebastian. Uh, with the uh, market, market now opening up to uh, different types of service providers, including also uh, funds, crypto funds, uh, fund admins, uh, as well as uh, traditional banks, uh, we see that um, uh, those actors or players in the market uh, try to understand what models uh, are available, because the ultimate goal is simply uh, to, to make the entry level for the crypto participation uh, as easy and simple, quick and cost effective as possible. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I, in my previous um, contribution, I mentioned that not everyone wants to develop the entire departments dedicated to compliance on crypto. The same applies to uh, technology, to infrastructure. Obviously, there will be some players with the vast infrastructure and uh, integration projects need to be dedicated to them. For, for others, Definitely uh, collaboration with third parties, uh, with partners, with integration providers makes absolutely sense um, because um, it's much more scalable. It's uh, simpler, quicker, and more cost effective. You can imagine this in the way also if we consider uh, our partnership indeed with Riddle and Code. If there is a pre integrated uh, API uh, connection and uh, both parties already understand the methodology, the process workflow, it is much easier than to interact with uh, the, the end uh, customers, the clients, uh, and understand their needs specifically. So this makes simply the, the process, the entry level, the barriers to enter the crypto space uh, much more efficient. Thanks a lot, uh, Jacek, for your uh, closing words. Uh, thanks a lot also to, to Barbara. Uh, I see you already posting some links. So with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to Carl Michael Henneking, the moderator of the last panel of today. Uh, Carl Michael is with Untitled Inc. Uh, and he's, you know, one of the leading experts and commentators uh, on the business. So I'm, I'm really glad that he now takes over the cross-industry pan-European uh, panel, including another uh, lawyer, uh, Nina, hello, uh, and some uh, colleagues from uh, different industries. Carl Michael, over to you. Yes, thanks, uh, Sebastian, and welcome uh, from my side to all the audience and definitely to my esteemed um, panelist colleagues here. As you already said, um, with this panel, we want to move beyond the financial service sector focus and look at other industries. And so it's great to have uh, Nina Siedler from DWF here uh, with us, uh, definitely an expert in not only in financial services, um, because she's also uh, a man founding member of the uh, Bundesblock, the German Blockchain Association. Uh, we have Anthony Day with us from uh, IBM, blockchain partner at IBM Services. I think you can definitely contribute with regards to all supply chain related aspects and um, 
blockchain won't save the world, I think is um, your podcast you're running. So it would be really interesting um, who could save the world in the end. And we have uh, David Palmer with us here, right? Um, blockchain lead IoT at Vodafone. So we have a telecom uh, a view as well. And Jens Strücker, who is professor at the um, University of Bayreuth, a uh, professor for information systems and digital energy management. So we have the energy focus here as well. So very warm welcome from my side to all the panelists. It's great to have you here uh, here on stage. Um, now, my first question maybe is a, is a totally personal question, or you can interpret it uh, the way you would like uh, to interpret it. Uh, CryptoPunk, um, 5, 000, first 5,000 days. Um, Ether Rock, Bored Apes, or you have any other NFT, digital NFT preferences? I start with Anthony. You seem to have a clear opinion on this. <laughs> That's a really tough one. I'm, what I love is the fact that you've now seen kind of spawns out of kind of from pixelated images of you know avatars out to slightly more high fidelity ones to 3D ones or out into actual real world avatars that you can really use in the metaverse. You know, you've got um, punks apes, lizards, pandas, koalas. I'm a big fan of the drop bears just because it, it kind of harks back to another joke and, and, and sort of got some family in Australia who, who would appreciate it. So if I were to buy an NFT, it would probably be that. I do, my first ever NFT actually was a, um, was a what was it called? Basically, it's kind of a, a, a world punk or a global punk. It's a picture of the Irish flag with a kind of pixelated face on the front. I think it's worth about 0. 0.000001 ETH. But as an avatar, it just makes me smile. So that's the one I went for. Okay, David, how about you? Um, I, I like the block arts uh, and I like the fact that um, it's, it's sort of democratizing the ability of artists or new digital artists to take take place. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, that would be mine. Um, I think NFTs, uh, you know, a really significant, uh, exciting uh, development on blockchain, um, but that would be mine. You know, so, so, so I like block arts and I like the... Um, uh, I, I like a lot of the art coming from there. So I, I bought a couple of them, hoping they, they'll go up. Okay, Jens, can you give us an academic perspective? Jens, are you- Hi there, sorry, first of all, sorry for the delay. Yeah. <laughs> I was on a very, uh, on a phone call, it was very urgent, sorry for that. Are you uh, maybe you with the question, question please? Uh, did, did, ah, no, the, oh, then um, uh, I'll, I'll continue with Nina, but then I'll give the question back to you. Um, so, CryptoPunks, Bored Apes, Etherrock, first 5,000 days, what your preferred digital NFT art object? But I'll start with Nina, so you have a second to think about it. I, I must admit, I don't really have the one favorite one. I'm really in love with the idea that we can now actually build digital twins for things that are not commoditized, because that's actually the way larger group of economic assets that are um, available in, you know, in, in our economic world. So the idea as such is really fascinating. And it's great to have a technology at hand now, which um, can actually link that into the digital world. Okay, Jens, do you have a favorite one? Or oh, you love Bored Apes? My preferred one, I'm a very conservative, Bored Apes 5809, the one with the golden fleur and this, uh, um, I think, blue metallic glasses. Yeah? Uh, what's, what's your favorite? Um, maybe I can, I can give a different answer because I think um, I, I'm really dreaming right now for, uh, of uh, things like how can we combine a kind of NFT, FT thing for, for the decarbonizing um, all kinds of assets. So CO2, for instance, if you look to CO2 certificates, uh, I think make a lot, makes a lot of sense to, to go with um, real tokenization on the one side. On the other side, we will need kind of more carbon footprint things there. And so I'm not sure. For me, this is something I, I'm dreaming of. Carbon okay, punks cool. coming soon. You watch out. Dropping next uh, week. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to this question later on in, in the discussion. Uh, but I think your choice of NFTs sometimes or supposedly tells us a lot about or a little bit about your personality here, I would say. 
Uh, the promise of MVT NFT is obviously that they allow to claim ownership of a digital data or arts objects and NFTs are minted um, uh, through smart contracts. Um, and that brings me to my first question. And I'm going to address this to, to Nina. Um, code is law, code isn't law. If code isn't law, smart contracts are law. What's all this discussion about smart contracts? Um, what's their legal and regulatory relevance? beyond the financial services sector. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you know, uh, we heard um, uh, Lucas Repa talking about that earlier. And let me just bring that up again. Mm -hmm. He said, alongside the open technical questions, he framed it nicely as the black box problem. Can we actually trust the code? What is it actually doing? There are um, open legal questions mainly surrounding um, to the uh, around the question um, of when does code turn actually into a legally binding agreement. And um, I personally believe that each single jurisdiction can actually answer that question, uh, more or less simply. Um, but unfortunately, the issue is that the national answers are not aligned, right? Each jurisdiction potentially answers this question in a different manner. Um, so, but, but let me, prior to getting more deeper into this question, um, I would like to draw your attention to an important distinction, which I would like to invite you all to keep in mind when you talk about smart contracts. You always need to make clear what you are actually talking about. Are you talking about a smart contract that is run centralized by one individual service provider um, or um, of the very different scenario of a smart contract actually being deployed in a public permissionless system with no backdoor, no super user key or alike retained. Um, so I think we need, really need to distinguish between those two use cases. And I, yeah, so maybe let's call them centralized smart contracts and decentralized smart contracts. So according to German law, uh, specifically in the centralized smart contract area, a contract may be closed by factual acts like offering a smart contract on the one hand by a provider and using the smart contract by a user on the other hand. Um, this may very well result in a contract, in a legal contract, um, based upon uh, conduct implying the respective intent. Um, so that certainly applies to centralized smart contract. And as a lawyer, I would always recommend um, to the one um, using smart contracts for their businesses to go for a, what we call the dual system. Um, that means having this, the technical smart contract being accompanied by a proper legal pros contract, construing what the use of the smart contract for the parties involved uh, shall actually mean. So delegating certain legal consequences to the use of um, the smart contract. Um, then obviously it becomes more difficult when the smart contract is not centralized, but run in a truly decentralized um, uh, fashion so that we must assume that a centralized service provider um, is actually missing. So a popular example for that are the AMMs, the automated market makers, if they are deployed in a decentralized fashion, it's, it's uh, then you actually end up with huge legal questions uh, what that uh, means. Um, so first of all, and you know, if Lucas is available later, I would love to address this question to him. Uh, when are actually legislators and regulators um, ultimately willing to accept the lack of a service provider for any given decentralized smart contract? What are the minimum requirements um, under which you know, they will not try to encumber that merely technical system with a financial or otherwise regulation? And um, uh, the other question is, are users using those decentralized smart contracts simply acting on their own risk? Or is there anybody, anyone left they can turn to um, for a recourse in case something goes wrong? So for example, uh, people advertising for such AMM or in case initiators build in like a fee model, which makes, um, which creates profit for them, um, despite the fact that they cannot amend or stop that smart contract anymore. Is that sufficient to still, you know, get hold of them? And that is like the gray area we, we still have 
in the smart contract phase, plus the urgent question of aligning the jurisdictions. Because, you know, for um, the, the economy, you can simply not handle um, that smart contract, specifically if used um, by consumers, um, are subject to 27 member states' um, national laws. If you would briefly answer this for Germany, very briefly, which kind of laws are involved here? Which kind of regulatory platform we are talking about? Oh, there are tons of laws involved in smart contracts. So first of all, um, obviously the civil law, um, which outlines when a contract is concluded and how to construe such contract once it is concluded. Then depending upon um, what type of, of tokens are concerned, in Germany, nearly every token is a financial instrument. So you will certainly touch um, the financial regulatory rules. And then obviously data protection kicks in uh, quite quickly. Um, you know, you can, you can discuss forever if hashing uh, anything actually helps or if um, like the, the, the public key is already a, a personal data, depending upon, um, you know, who owns um, that. Then tokens you know, what are actually tokens? Um, I will hopefully have the chance to come that, to that later again. But, um, you know, according to German law, a token is basically a nothing. Um, it's not protected like a right or um, like a physical object um, currently. And then, you know, if you're building a platform, you've got tons of other uh, regulations also kicking in. Excellent. Okay, this gives us a good overview and a kind of basis maybe for the uh, for the uh, further discussion here. I want to switch topic a little bit. Um, and Anthony, uh, you recently wrote an, an interesting blog post on it called Six Steps to Solving the Sustainability Data Challenge. Tell me, what is this about? What sustainability targets, sustainability targets are you talking about? What role does blockchain and smart contracts play in here? Got you. Th thank you for the question and, and thank you also to Nina. No one talks about blockchain law in as much of a passionate and approachable way as Nina does. So it's always, it's always a, a pleasure to listen to you talk about the law. Um, so uh, switching back to sustainability, I mean, th the article is a little bit clickbaity. Uh, sorry, anybody who knows me knows me. I'm a little bit that way. But sustainability is very clearly a physical real world problem. But what we're trying to do is to drive human behavior. And you said at the beginning of the show, you know, if blockchain won't save the world, who will? Well, ultimately, we will. Right? It's about us as individuals. It's about the leaders in corporations, the leaders in government, or simply the people working on a day to day basis in organizations or different constructs to make changes. The challenge we have is that all of the climate system issues around carbon, around temperature, around ocean acidification, around land use, around deforestation are not going at a kind of a corporate three to 5% a year increase. They are growing exponentially. And so expecting individual companies to make changes in a two to three to 5% improvement every year to kind of claw back the damage we're doing is insufficient. So what we need to do is we need to work together. We need to work in an automated and global way. We need to enable transparency and trust to allow humans to make choices around what we can do better or different. Now, anybody know a form of technology that helps to provide some of those digital capabilities? Yeah, blockchain. So what, what we're looking at is how can we use the digital capabilities that exist there? Transparency, data, connectivity, identity management, automation, tokenization where it's appropriate for allocation, settlement, reconciliation, uh, reconciliation ownership, to be able to change the behaviors or the outcomes that we're looking to. In some cases, they're regulated, right? Some industries are more regulated than others when it comes to emissions or when it comes to use of um, reusable products, um, the plastic tax regulations coming in in the UK, France and Spain, or UK, Italy and Spain, I think in April 2022 next year, which will mandate that plastic packaging has to be at least 30% recycled. That's a good start, but it's not really moving the needle. But if you take that one specific example, as a result, what you need to then know as an organization, whether you are a product manufacturer, whether you're a retailer, whoever it is, you need to know the volume of packaging that's in your supply chain and the bill of materials that went into that. And then as a result, is it or is it not compliant? That data needs to come from multiple different providers for multiple different products, for different categories, for different geographies, and then needs to be aggregated up to pay the taxman. 
So you've already got a data aggregation automation challenge there. The interesting part here is that you're, let's, let's get away from individual regulations and let's talk about a connected supply chain. So if you are able to have, and at the moment, something like 60% of companies have a decent degree of visibility, one up, one down, one, you know, one, one tier down in supply chain, one tier up in customer, but you've got customers, customers, and you've got suppliers of suppliers, which you start getting into 17%, 10%, 5%, 0% visibility on where your products or materials actually come from. With a more connected supply chain, we can improve that transparency. Right? We can connect, connect a cloud-based ledger or connect by, via the cloud to a ledger, private, permissioned, or public, doesn't matter. Right? I know IBM are typically more known for private and permissioned. That's what our enterprise clients typically ask for because of some of the identity and integration requirements. Um, we are the light beer of blockchain. It's okay. We're, we're, you know, we're okay with that as a moniker. But... Once you have that connectivity between all those parties, you can start doing some other interesting things too. Circularity, particularly being one of the initiatives. So as we talk about reusable packaging, all of the material that's being used in all of those different entities across an upper supply chain is being managed individually by those companies in a, in a sort of local context. If you imagine replacing that as a linear flow with individual actors to being a marketplace or, or, or kind of a connected group, you can actually start saying, well, I need to use a certain amount of raw material, a certain amount of packaging, or a certain amount of plastic for products and materials or manufacturing that happens upstream or downstream. Where can I get it from? The spot market for recycled plastic or recycled feedstock is only going to increase in cost over time because regulation is going to require it, which means more companies are going to be looking for it in the open market. And up to a point, it's a scarce resource. So the smarter organizations and those that we're working with realize this ahead of time and are starting to create these marketplaces for circularity and, and reusable products. In some cases, in a private network, because it actually creates competitive advantage. It impacts your cost of goods sold, it impacts your regulatory compliance, and as a result, cost of compliance. So I don't want to delve too deeply into the unsexy world of cost of compliance and finance and procurement, but as a data platform, that's critical. Okay, so we can all can even say like blockchain here is an enabler for fulfilling regulatory targets. It's not like this being on the opposite side, which we see in the financial world uh, very often. Uh, um, they don't regulate at all. There's not enough regulation, whatever uh, you look at it here. Blockchain is really the true enabler uh, for, let's say, meeting ESG, so environmental, social and governance targets. That's yeah. cool. Blockchain, I think, is also an enabler um, in the transition of the Internet of Things to the economy of things, David, right? Um, um, can you give us a little bit more insights on this from a telecom operator's viewpoint? Sure. Um, so, so, so I think the, the, the key uh, sort of points I want to, to, to make is, um, you know, what we're discussing here and why we're discussing regulation is that there's a transition to to what what I call the economy of tokens, right? So there's a whole, um, you know, since uh, 2019, a big um, exponential growth in in, in tokens. Uh, you know, most most companies, um, you know, are, are, are looking at tokens. Uh, there's a lot of protocols that have tokens associated with it, and, and these are forming an a, an economy with um, protocols like Uniswap uh, facilitating the market and exchange function. Um, in terms of the economy of things and telco. I mean, part of what we've been looking at is how can we use blockchain technology um, to bring telco to uh, blockchain, to bring, bring adoption, uh, to automate our processes. One of the key use cases being Internet of Things. Um, and Internet of Things, if you think about it, 70 billion IoT devices in the next uh, you know, sort of five years, 70 to 100 billion. Uh, and, and, you're, and you're sort of looking and you're saying, okay, what is the next stage? IoT at the moment is about data. Uh, that data is going to um, spur a lot of this digital economy uh, transition uh, that, that, that's going on. Uh, but how do we monetize it? How do we take it to the next step? Uh, and, and, to, and to do that, you're looking at um, things, devices, uh, interacting autonomously with other devices, uh, with no human uh, uh, interaction, uh, sometimes with no intermediary. Uh, and that gives a lot of rise to blockchain, right? Uh, you want a car to speak to an EV charger, to speak to a toll, to pay congestion charging, to sell data, to buy data. That economy will be uh, facilitated by automation. And a good candidate for that is blockchain, uh, which provides a trust. Uh, so that the two, uh, um, two, two devices can trust each other. There's a certificate that they can both um, trust. And then the other side of it is the smart contract. Because if, you, you know, if a car is going to buy 
um, uh, charging from a toll uh, for, from an EV charger automatically. Uh, the means for that automation is a smart contract. Once you've got through the authentication, your smart contract will authenticate the price of the transaction, the terms and the conditions. Now, now going forwards, of course, I agree with Nina, we've got to look at um, jurisdiction. We've got to look at how we turn code into a smart legal agreement. We've got to look at custody. But in essence, um, what we're looking at is the potential of this technology to facilitate this new economy and, and the smart contract and blockchain being components which are at the, at the center of that. Um, may I ask you a little bit about regulation? I mean, I have a strong telecom background myself, serving chief position in telco operators. Um, we always see, uh, not the same way as we talk with Anthony now, uh, regulation is always a kind of uh, restriction here. We see hurdles coming. Telco regulation, I would say, is quite straightforward. The regulation with regards to blockchain um, is, I would say, still in a kind of immature stage, uh, if I, I phrase this. In this transition from the economy of, of the Internet of Things to what you call the economy of tokens or uh, the economy, economy of things, things, economy of tokens. Yeah, uh, how, how do you see regulation play a role there? I mean, but you have telco regulation which has certain GDPR uh, issues as well. And then you have this, this kind of blockchain financial settlement world. Uh, where do you see the, the issues or opportunities in this respect? I, I, think, I, I think regulation, and, and I think this, this conference is timely, is one of the key things that we ignore uh, in the world of crypto. I'm a crypto enthusiast. I, I also work in regulation. On the crypto DeFi side, we know regulations coming. We know uh, if you look at Germany, France, the EU uh, last year, that, that, that there's been some stab at regulation. Um, if you look at the, the, the sort of uh, Managed Crypto Act um, and others that are coming. Um, but, but it's really um, to say, all right, here's a sandbox. You know, you can play with some certainty. Uh, but if you're looking at a security token, we don't know how that's going to pan out yet. How do you regulate regulate DeFi and a protocol? Um, how do you you know who do you call where there's no how, how do you regulate where there's no intermediary? So 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 there's some nervousness about the regulatory side of the the sort of more innovative um, aspects of blockchain and DeFi and crypto. However, um, I, I I think we we could also look at it another way, uh, which is that you know we are regulated in telco. Um, there's some things that we are regulated to do. So uh, in terms of providing credit, in terms of our cryptography being trusted, in terms of our, fi our finances, and, and maybe um, if, you, if you're looking at um, utility tokens and you're looking at, um, at tokens that support uh, things like the economy of things, uh, we can play a role. Uh, and part of that role is to, is to maybe um, help manage the transition. Um, I personally don't believe that we're going to have a big bank to a token economy. I think it's a transition. Mm -hmm. And I think in that transition, um, you know, tomorrow in the economy of things, things won't be paying uh, in tokens all the 100% uh, of the time. Maybe that's going to be 10% a, a of the time to begin with. And the majority of it will be using real world transactions like uh, payment cards uh, and, and bank transactions. Um, but but you know, part of what we're saying is, okay, uh, that's regulated. We can go with that. Um, you know, we can use current regulation, we can employ smart contracts, as Nina was saying, to work centrally and decentrally. Um, but, but going forwards, we can also leverage our position um, to, to, to start to make some headway into uh, the sort of token transactions, peer-to-peer, -peer, and, and, and even going forward, some of the more um, innovative types of uh, token uh, functions. Uh, I won't name them, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you know, th that, that way. So, so my view on regulation is that, in summary, it, it's still evolving. Um, I, I think there's going to be some competition in the areas uh, to support this new exciting uh, type of uh, commerce that's coming from blockchain and, and DeFi. Uh, I don't think we know how it's going to pan out, but I, I, I do see some, some competition. But I think in the meantime, let's play with the regulation we know. And uh, as telcos, I think, um, as you said, we are regulated and, and we will look for um, a safe position under our regulation uh, to start this transition and, and embrace uh, some of the, the more trusted and, and, and certain areas of token, token transfers. Okay, cool. Jens, um, you're a strong advocate of a kind of radical transformation, um, not gradual transformation of the let's say, energy industry, and it's a transformation towards what you call real-time energy management. What role does blockchain and what role do smart contracts play uh, in this respect? 
Yeah, so I mean, this is a hard one to switch from uh, telecom, telecom industry to, to the energy industry. I mean, um, I would say the telco industry still is um, around, I would guess, a decade or so ahead of time when it comes to regulation, when it comes to um, to come to a more digital, digitized uh, process chain um, in general. So, as you said, my, my field of expertise is the energy industry, and the energy industry actually was for uh, was one of the forerunners uh, applying blockchain technology, and then many, uh, I, I would say, very interesting pilot projects uh, stopped or slowed down uh, at least, and. Um, my impression is that there are two, mainly two reasons for that. Uh, one is regulation. Um, many startups simply underestimated uh, the, the inertia of interest groups, of course, and common players and so on. And the second, and this is important for our discussion, second is uh, the digital gap we still have uh, in, in Germany, in Europe, and I also think in the United States and many other countries. Um, so two things, one is it's the entire system is still very analog. Uh, so if you want to switch, switch your, your PV, your PV, your rooftop installation or your um, electric vehicle or um, your heat pump, etc., from one market role to another, from uh, self-generation or consumption, your power uh, from um, kind of system services you can provide to uh, sell your energy to the market. Today, this is still very analog. It, it's not a digital process at all. Uh, so blockchain here comes in into the play because blockchain with smart contracts, et cetera, you can simply automize things. Um, some people argue that we first should see to these analog challenges or digitalize uh, all the, the process chains we have and after we have fixed the underlying problems here, we can move on to address things like regulating smart contracts, tokens, and so on. Um, I think the specific energy regulation challenges here are closely interconnected, um, connected with um, all the things uh, for the uh, regulation uh, regarding uh, tokens, smart contracts, etc. So this means we don't have to wait and we can do this in parallel or and start right now in the energy industry. And luckily, for, for instance, in, in Germany, we did. Uh, the, the department or the, uh, the Federal Ministry, ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, uh, they shared this view and they came up with a blockchain strategy, strategy for the energy sector. And uh, so we have a couple of projects there to say, okay, we can do more like, it more like a leapfrogging approach. But um, this is the very first stage right now. And the question is, what, what's next? So regulatory sandbox, for instance. And, and just to give you a tiny bit here uh, of information or uh, um, view into Germany right now, um, the energy market or the energy system in Germany, if you go look there from a regulatory perspective, we have the one side that is everything uh, you, 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 when it comes to uh, heat, heating, for instance, and the, the other side is electricity. And in the electricity side, the electricity part here is uh, excluded from the regulatory sandboxes in Germany. So at least the ones we want to fund. Uh, so, and I would say it would be a very good idea. There's a great match, a very good fit there um, that we need to Im implement these kind of sandboxes there because we have a market design challenge here. We have um, questions uh, when it comes to all the things like uh, automating with smart contracts, working with them. Um, we have much, much more um, challenges here and we, we don't know the one, the one answer, so we have to do a kind of uh, trial and error approach. Mm, thank you very much. It brings me um, directly to my next question. First of all, I see there are certain kind of similarities in different industries, what problems we have to deal with. I think Nina in the beginning also gave a good overview of the laws involved, and I think they are uh, more or less relevant for, for each industry sector. 
Uh, you all pointed out the challenges. Um, Jens, you already gave an answer maybe to my question, but I would like to address it at least to the others as well here. Um, if we have this kind of regulatory uncertainty and at the same time, a kind of ever increasing technology speed. So regulators might not be able to keep up with it um, if the industry themselves are, are even able to keep up with it. What would you be your advice how to best maneuver in such an uh, environment? Um, and let's take not the startup, let's take an incumbent player in this environment. What would be the best way to maneuver? Uh, Nina, do you have an answer to this? Well, um, if you're talking about um, the, 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 the regulators or legislators, I would say do not try to encumber any kind of exchangeable token by financial regulation. That's what's currently taking place. Leave room for the non-financial industry to get acquainted with the technology and build use cases which are at their core of non-financial character. Limit yourself to regulated liquid markets, right? Without assuming that any asset which may be liquidly traded must automatically be a financial asset. This is really stifling innovation. Um, and, and well, financial industry, please excuse, but are we really expecting that this highly regulated in industry will be capable of being the only one driver for innovation in the technical space? I don't think so. So yeah, that, that would be like, yeah, my, my advice or my ask um, for oh. the current legislators. I fully agree with you. Anthony, um, would you add anything here? I'll add three things, actually, if, if I may, oh. I'll try to be brief. Yeah. Um, thing yeah. one, lawyer up, right? Find, find yourself counsel who are proactive, who understand technology and who understand the decentralized space uh, because proactive, collaborative legal counsel is critical in the blockchain space. It's not always easy to find. There are many great lawyers out there who are in this space. And again, it does vary by jurisdiction. But you know, thing one, make sure you've got a collaborative dialogue with a legal team that are, that are supporting that discussion. Thing two is understand the jurisdiction you're in. I think there are a number of very positive stories around collaborative regulation in certain jurisdictions like Singapore, Switzerland, you could argue Malta, you could maybe argue Germany, maybe not, I'm not gonna go there, mm -hmm. but regulators are not beyond, um, at UAE as well, Abu Dhabi, um, regulators are not beyond engagement with the industry and we're talking about incumbents here. So, so if you are able to demonstrate a win-win for industry and government or authorities, it's not beyond the possibility of collaborative regulatory um, development. Thing three, in the absence of that, right, and this is a pure strategy point, this is not a blockchain point, it's saying what would need to be true for us to be able to develop platforms that would have a business case or commercial case that allows us to transform. If in your jurisdiction, it's not possible to get beyond that regulation until you've got some advisory. Don't build something that is a halfway house that doesn't have value, right? You know, don't try and reinvent processes that are broken in a blockchain way because that's actually not, that's not going to bring the value that we know the technology can deliver or you're not going to transform in the way that your business case will enable, will support you to do. And a lot of business, a lot of um, blockchain initiatives have fallen down, not because the tech wasn't ready or, or wasn't able to do the things that we needed to do, wasn't because we didn't get the right governance between the parties right, it's just because the business case fell down and that we couldn't create the value that could continue to allow us to invest in the technology. That's excellent and brief, uh, brief and precise advice. Uh, David, how do you see this? Uh, please uh, look at the incumbent player. I mean, you can even say it for the telco industry because uh, we have a lot of incumbent players there. Apologies, I was on mute. Um, so the so first thing I say is that we, we have some lessons learned. So there was one project, I won't name it, um, by a big social media company, uh, which didn't do the homework on regulation before announcing, and we saw what happened. Um, so, so I agree totally with what Nina and Anthony have said. Um, I, I think you've got to take a, a two-layered approach. I think one of them is embrace the innovation of this. There's, there's huge potential in tokenization, blockchain, uh, DeFi, and, and, and these types of technology. And I think uh, incumbent players who are looking for new business models, new business opportunities, uh, should keep an eye and, and keep invested in these technologies. But I do agree that that needs to be um, in the context of sandboxes and, um, and, and relatively risk-free um, environments. And I think, uh, again, the EU and others are, 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 are supporting and creating those. 
Um, I, I think the second thing is, um, you know, where you're implementing something for real, um, you know, in, in the blockchain token space, permission blockchains, uh, you know, with established players, uh, where you're having uh, governance, which is in line with the regulation, um, you know, is the way to go. So, for example, a use case for telco is roaming, right? So we, we're launching roaming uh, uh, blockchain uh, solutions in conjunction with our, our partners in telco. Um, but, but that's in line with regulation and, the, and there's a clear established regulated uh, and known role for blockchain. And then the third thing I'd say is, you know, plan a transition. Uh, so, so you've got to hedge um, the current position and, and, and the uh, established regulation uh, with some eye on the future. Uh, and, and that's working with experts like Nina, uh, you know, and Anthony, et cetera, to say, okay, um, you know, we're doing roaming now. Uh, there's a big uh, opportunity for this sort of blockchain application in the future. Um, you know, how do we transition? What are our dependencies? Um, you know, uh, what, what are the timelines for this to be done? And then I think you're on the front foot. But um, as opposed to a startup, which can maybe take more risk, uh, we've got to look at this sort of uh, two-stream approach. Clear answer. Um, and I like your roaming example because I think it's one of the let's say most discussed um, blockchain applications um, uh, in, in telco. Absolutely great. Jens, you already kind of alluded to uh, how you see um, what, let's say, incumbent players should do or if they can do anything. Uh, what's your position? Uh, you are muted. Sorry for that. So again, in the energy industry, I would say, the incumbents, um, the, the, the position of the incumbents is not that bad right now, I would say. So it's possible to work within the regulatory framework today to start there and come up with good ideas. For, for example, uh, today the press in Germany was all about, about regulating charging stations for e vehicles. Uh, and the funny thing is, uh, <laughs> and I didn't make, may, make this up, it, it's a real story. Uh, the, the bill right now we discuss, it mandates to use debit cards. So technology from the 90s. Uh, th this is the reality today. And of course, incumbents, uh, the utilities, many different companies there, um, they have new ideas, innovative ideas, of course. Yeah. So, but, but this is, I, I would just mention here the, the thing of maybe an aspect, maybe it's, it's also relevant to look at the regular, regulators um, themselves. So maybe we should innovate, see more innovation happening there. Uh, so it would be a good idea to, to push them a little bit. And it, it's a good idea to think about regulatory sandboxes, but that's, that's not all. So there's much more in it, right? So the regulator, regulators themselves, they should come up with new ideas um, and learn from all these new tools like a regulatory sandbox. And we have a lot of different ones there we can use, make use of. Um, we need systematic learning there. This is very important from my perspective. Okay, so this is a, a call out for regulatory capacity building um, uh, to provide the right framework and guideline for the blockchain industry. So cool. I think we are almost uh, approaching the end of this, um, of this conversation. Um, my personal takeaway, I don't want to repeat the discussion. Um, I think all of you gave super valuable insight here, but um, maybe a little bit boring or stealing from Anthony. I think uh, it's not regulation, it's not technology. technology. I think to unlock the full potential of emerging technologies, it's people that matters. And um, in this case, a big thank you to all my panelists for sharing their views and insights here. Definitely, it was a big pleasure. We can go on talking another two hours, but I think Sebastian wouldn't allow us uh, to do. I uh, thank you to our audience for listening. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and thanks to Sebastian and the Riddle and Co team for organizing um, this um, event together with Disrupt Networks. And uh, with this, I hand over to Sebastian again. And I directly hand over to Eisenor. Uh, she has uh, collected some of the questions that came in through the chat box and we'll try to answer, answer them collectively.
we can't hear you properly. Your mic makes some strange noises. Or was I the only one? Can you hear me now? Not very well, no. Now? Yeah, now? perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so I want to open up the Q&A session and want to give you, you want to give the opportunity to everybody uh, get into the game. And uh, please, um, all our speakers, please unmute yourselves and feel free to join the conversation. Um, I just actually have written down the questions came in and, um, you know, we already have uh, discussed the regulatory applications in, in DAC regions. And um, there was also another interesting question about the applications in all Europe, in, in specific countries. Um, at the moment, you know, many countries are coming up uh, with their own regulations uh, with regards to digital assets and all of, the, all of these individual approaches compatible with MICA. Um, so, are they um, are they compatible with the MICA, or will this lead to challenges for the harmonization uh, under LICA, uh, MICA? So, maybe, uh, maybe I, I I pick that one up. Um, so um, the idea behind MICA is that it is a regulation, which means that it is directly applicable in all member states. So it will overrule uh, national legislation that doesn't conform to MICA. The question specifically now from the German angle, where we like to gold plate everything, um, is um, it, it, you can already tell that the definition of our crypto asset in the German banking law is wider than the one in Mika. So what does that mean? Well, you know, the extension of banking regulation applying to the German crypto asset vanish with Mika. Or will it remain so that we will have like the Mika regulation covering the crypto assets as defined in, in Mika plus then the remaining rest for Germany? So that's that's one interesting question. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, as we started with Mika, I want to continue uh, with another question that is also related with Mika. Um, Mika does not directly address anti-money laundry and, and CF, CFT risks, but expects uh, crypto asset service providers to comply with uh, FATF and fifth AML directive to ensure the crypto uh, are not being used for illicit activities. So how is that going to be supervised on national level, especially in Germany, and will be the legal basis to take these actions or any sanctions? Well, that's actually an easy question to answer because we have already a national um, uh, anti-money laundry uh, law in place, right? And that will remain in place and it's, it's constantly adopted to the changing uh, European anti-money laundry uh, rules. So, and, and, and also there you see gold plating going on. So the German um, AML rules are stricter than the current European one. One very popular example for that is um, like the, uh, that it's necessary um, to use a video ident procedure where everybody else in, in Europe is laughing <laughs> about, because in, in Germany, you can only verify your identity either by showing up in person, showing, you know, while you're in one room, your ID, or you need to use video ident. And other um, jurisdictions in, in Europe permit, you know, uh, in addition to that, other easier digital means to verify your identity. And that's one hope, you know, we have with um, the uh, self-sovereign identity initiatives uh, where we have several in Germany. One of the chancellor offers um, another one supported by the Ministry uh, of Interior. Um, that's the one bringing the ID card into the smartphones directly. Um, and, and another one uh, which had been initiated and is financially supported by the Ministry of Economics, that's ID Union. So we are seeing a lot of initiatives um, to make more ease in, in that area. Thank you, Nina. Um, there was another question about, you know, um, the funds are in Germany, they're, um, they're allowed to invest in crypto. Um, the question is about that, uh, about this, this law. Um, so is this just only for the fund investment or is just also, does also include the fund administration as well? 
There is on the European level um, a directive which is called um, the Alternative Investment Fund Manager Directive. So it regulates the manager of such alternative investment funds. I'm not sure if that question relates to that directive, uh, which as you can tell by the name, um, must have been implemented by the nation states on a single basis. Um, maybe the one having raised the question can clarify. Yeah, please feel free to share that in chat um, so we can, we can have a better understanding about your question. Um, there was another question about the um, jurisdiction, which is specifically, is there any jurisdiction specifically uh, already tackling the smart contract regulation uh, space as a scaler for all the nice applications around NFTs, DAOs, and DeFi uh, gaining momentum? Well, as I said, you know, smart contracts are already regulated today by the current laws and, and regulations. One which may come into my mind is the new law on DAOs in Wyoming. So that might be an interesting space to look at because they try to specifically get their heads around um, these questions. One area that we could maybe add there, and please feel free to, to, to jump in, Jens. Um, we are working together, for example, on a registry project in Germany for energy producing assets hosted by DENA, the German energy agency. And DENA is now starting to also look into smart contract registries, because if you are, of course, part of a not only regulated industry, but an industry that has security concerns to cover, um, then, of course, a registry, at least for smart contracts, is something, I would say, in the middle grounds between regulation and, you know, the situation we, we have now, as Nina described, that smart contracts are, of course, also covered by, by existing, um, not blockchain-specific laws. Um, thank you, Sebastian. Um, there was another question about the token and one community community tokens. Um, are there any community token regulated in Germany? How about the prospects of tokenization in the energy market? And what is the most favorable jurisdiction for this? Could you repeat the first part? So what type of token does this relate how are, to? Yeah, sure. Um, how are the community token regulated in Germany? Community tokens? Or? Yeah. I think that means utility tokens could be i think yeah. okay if 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 utility tokens means the native token of a blockchain so to speak the token that is used to pay gas or transaction fees within that given system then that is typically a cryptocurrency or a crypto asset as we now define it plus a, a unit of account from a german law perspective so it's a financial instrument in any case Thank you, Nina. And there was another question about the, I think about our latest panel. What is the panel's opinion on marketplaces for security tokens? Since European regulators are not taking action for a regulatory framework, will there be any chance to trade security tokens via DEX? Well, the regulator is taking action, right? So Mika is encumbering exactly specifically uh, exchanges. Um, so I am afraid, um, you know, the opinion that the European regulator is not taking any action is not really true. In Germany, um, exchanges are already regulated, right? So you need the typical license, uh, depending upon your business model, might be financial commissioning business, um, might be proprietary trading, but it will certainly require some license from a German perspective. And um, it, it, Europe is basically adopting to that. And if we talk about decentralized exchanges, then of course there are some discussions currently underway whether a group of developers are, you know, going to be held responsible. Uh, but it depends, I think, on the commercial structure of the business. And then quickly, of course, it has to play along the lines of regulation for, let's say, centralized exchanges that are registered in, in one country, such as Nina pointed out. Yeah, that's exactly the really interesting question. Uh, you know, what makes a decentralized venture decentralized enough to be outside of regulation? That's really the core question in this whole scene currently. And certainly, you know, any type of business model you construe around, uh, you know, taking out fees um, on a long term out of such system will 
bring you at risk, right? If you design a system, even though you throw away your super user key, you don't have built in any backdoor, you can't amend and touch this thing anymore. If you built in a feature that um, leads to the effect that you're constantly taking out fees, that might be sufficient to make you treat it as provider or service provider in that case, being fully regulated. Thank you, Nina and Sebastian. Um, as I remember, there was also an Andrew question about the AML for DeFi, but I think Barbara uh, from CoinFarm already replied that um, they are providing services, um, specific products for, for that area. So I would recommend to check their services and, and feel free to reach out to them for your further questions. Um, I think we are at the end of our Q&A session. Perfect. Just in time for my next meeting. I hope most of you will have a lunch break uh, before they have to, uh, you know, jump into this afternoon's business. So thank you everybody for joining and staying with us. We know it's quite a long session, but um, as you all realize, we, we only scratched the surface and, and we could go on for hours. That's also one of the reasons why not only Carl Michael or Anthony are for sure recording additional uh, episodes of their respective um, podcasts. Uh, but we will also, you know, uh, currently start or immediately start to prepare our next webinar. So please uh, watch out for it. Um, you can subscribe to our LinkedIn page or you will receive emails uh, from us or the organizers. Um, the next one in October will most likely uh, be around, you know, financial solution architecture. We talked about EPSI a little bit. So we are trying to cross or build the bridge and then cross it together between you know the financial systems that we see uh, in the banking industry and in the fintech space today and and what corporate treasuries or um, corporates will need in the future to enter into uh, circular economies for example uh, based around tokens so with all of that uh, thanks again not only for our uh, fellow speakers today but for all of you joining uh, as said the recording will be made available um, during the week and you will all be informed and we hope to see you soon and of course we do hope really that you were able to uh, you know take away some learnings today and uh, that you were inspired by these discussions thanks to all of you talk soon bye